नमस्कार 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 Uh, Dr. Padnaik, uh, you will be uh, sharing uh, the, my presentation. I have to share from here. No, no, that's because we are ready for that. As you suggest, we can share from our end. I think I will try to share. If it's not, I'll just uh, spend some few seconds. Yes, sir. No. Yeah. Uh, if it's not working, yeah. then you can. Uh, sure, sir. So I, sure, made, sure. Uh, I made small changes. So. Okay, sir. No problem. Now, apart from that, uh, handling the slides from own side has advantages. So shall I? Shall I start? Just, just a minute, sir. So we have till yeah, one or two minutes sure. till there. Sure, sure. I think you should first try to say that in case a problem, uh, Patna will display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do that. Our people will do that. Yeah, it is sharing very well. No problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. You're able to see? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. Yes, perfectly all right. So I think we can start now, sir. Now, yeah. Yeah. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning. From where? We, yeah. Depending on from where you are watching. So now this is the the our the our local afternoon session, invited session. So may I now request Professor S K Das, sir, to kindly chair this session to give a brief introduction about Professor S K Das. Dr. Das entered Math Science in 1975 as a PhD student in the PRL, the Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad, after an illustrated academic career in physics. Professor Das superintended from IIT Delhi as professor and head in the Center for Atmospheric Science and is currently associated with the Center of Atmosphere in Climate Modeling as visiting scientist, Center of Excellence. In his 47 years of experience in teaching and research, Professor Das has successfully supervised 20 PhD, 16 MTech, MPhil, MSc, MCA students. Professor Das is actively involved in R&D activity, including 35 sponsored projects. His main area of interest are interannual variability of Indian monsoon, climate modeling, climate change studies, and HPC, high power computing in environmental sciences. Professor Das has illustrated 140 plus referred papers in journals of report. He has been deputed to many reputed institutions across the world as visiting scientist. Professor Das has been the fellow of and president of Indian Mass Society, fellow of Royal Mass Society UK, and the member of the Indian Academy of Sciences India. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, important session of uh, IWM7. In fact, it is continuation of the same session, uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal. And uh, as you know, it's a very, very, not only scientifically challenging, but also uh, of a lot of societal benefits and of uh, operational importance. And in this session, there are four distinguished uh, scientists uh, from across the world, uh, from India, China, Japan, and uh, they have contributed to this field uh, immensely. Uh, first speaker will be uh, Dr. M. Rajivan, who is uh, very much uh, well known across the world. Uh, they have uh, prepared this slide uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Rajivan to the audience, but uh, he's well known and it's not necessary to really speak much about him because uh, he has contributed immensely to the Indian monsoon and uh, especially the 
data, you know, this uh, grid data, he, he, uh, concept wise and uh, generated this, which has been helping a lot of scientists across the world. And he has also worked on the extremes uh, of Indian monsoon, uh, monsoon variability, signal forecasting, climate change and extreme weather events, prediction of mesoscale systems and development of climate data sets like grid and full data, as I told. He was a member of the WCRP Cliver Asian Australian Monsoon Panel and presently a member in the research board of WMO. He has more than 140 research papers and presently he is working as uh, MOES uh, Distinguished Scientist uh, after his uh, superannuation as uh, Secretary to Government of India in the Ministry of uh, Arts Sciences. He was there during 2015 to 2021, and uh, he has significant contribution to monsoon mission and deep ocean project, which is coming about in future. A lot of contributions he has made. Now I request Dr. Rajivan, instead of wasting any more time, to speak on this uh, Indian uh, monsoon mission. He's uh, speaking. Thank you, about uh, thank you, Professor S K Dash and Dr. Padnaik uh, for uh, introdu introducing. Me and I will be giving a talk about uh, 15 minutes or so. First, let me share this uh, presentation. Yeah, so I'll be talking uh, basically on uh, monsoon mission, which uh, India has launched a few years back, and what uh, what are the achievements uh, in terms of uh, short to medium range weather forecasting. So that I'll be briefing uh, briefly. I'll be talking about with the, some uh, some good examples. And as all of us know that Indian monsoon uh, prediction is very important because monsoon rainfall amounts to 80% of annual rainfall and uh, economy, life and property in the region are vulnerable to significant variability of monsoon on different time scale, day to day, intra annual. Until 2009, IMD, IMD is the uh, general, uh, is the main organization, the, the responsible organization for issuing weather and climate forecasts and mornings. So IMD has been issuing short range forecasting using some regional models, et cetera. Uh, well, the medium range forecasts were issued based on a very low resolution global NWP model like T, T180 or so, a T80 or so. Then general operational dynamic system for extended range forecasting system, extended range prediction was not at all there. It was not exist, existing. And seasonal forecast, of course, we have been uh, India has been doing it since 1886, but mostly it is indigenously developed based on indigenously developed set skill models. So then there was a need to uh, for the uh, for for the country to develop um, substantial capability in terms of monsoon prediction because we know that monsoon prediction in all time scales are uh, monsoon prediction in all time scale is very very important, and for agriculture, water resources, the disaster management, etc. Uh, so the 2012, the, uh, the monsoon mission was launched uh, with the ultimate aim of improving forecast in all time scales. And, um, uh, and the first phase was for about five years, 2012 to 2017, and second phase was about 2017-22, and third phase, I think this is being launched from this year. And uh, the, 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 the purpose is uh, to improve the forecast. So we invited the proposals from different organizations different international or institutions, and we invited the participation of leading scientific meteorologists and modelers uh, who are interested in monsoon research from different countries to participate, and we provided them financial support. And so far, we have funded about 65, 66 projects, and out of that, half of them are more, uh, more than, little more than half of them are from India, and about 30 percent of the projects were given to U.S. Uh, scientists in U.S., about 20 projects were given to US project and four projects were given to UK, Australia, Japan, France, Canada, and the UAE. And so all this is this a huge uh, collaborative program involving Indian scientists, Indian academic institutions, MOS institutions, and also international uh, participants, international researchers. And ultimately, we could really do an excellent job. And the, the, the ultimate aim, ultimate uh, result was that we could, India could develop a full fledged forecasting system, almost like a seamless forecasting system, dynamical prediction system from right from short range forecast to seasonal forecast, even on climate change projections, et cetera. 
So we have a model from uh, starting from 1.5 kilometer regional model, and we have a 4 kilometer regional model based on UK Met Office. So we have two systems, one based on UK Met Office uh, systems models, and another is based on NSUB models. So we have two different systems existing, and all these models are being used by IMD for their day-to-day -day forecast. Yeah, in terms of global model, we have about a resolution of T1534. It's a total kilometer model, a global model, and we use both deterministic as well as ensemble prediction system. So we have two ensemble prediction system of uh, about the day 40, uh, sorry, 40 ensembles, and also we have a deterministic model of 12 kilometer. Then we have for extended range forecast system, we have a couple suit of model, couple models starting from 32 kilometer model. And we also have an edge system model. First time for the country, we had developed a system model, which is of a force resolution. But then uh, it is also based on the end sub GFS, CFS model. So we have a suit of biodata for air pollution, especially for predicting air pollution over Delhi region. We have a very high resolution, 400 meter Delhi air pollution prediction model, which is operational now. So and also 330 meter Delhi fog, fog prediction model. So right from a small, uh, very high resolution, we have. Uh, starting from a very regional localized model to uh, global models. And um, so, so data assimilation will be a part of uh, you know, all this initiative and we have spent a lot of uh, time and uh, investment, we made a lot of investment in improving a data assimilation. One good example, so we could uh, get good, uh, good connections with DMATSAT, we could get good connection with Department Meteorological Agency uh, and Chinese Meteorological Agency. And we could derive all the satellite data which are available now. And uh, we have improved our data inputs into the models. And uh, one good example is the values we means, you know, that it has come, uh, you, you, the, the, the satellite provide you the vertical profile of winds, especially in the upper troposphere. And this they we started as assimilating to the model. And it is a really, and I was told that it's going to be a big breakthrough in terms of data assimilation. This means uh, we, we barely wanted the vertical solution vertical profile of the winds. And we this is a good example of how cyclone activity formed in the Arabian Sea was predicted using this kind of data assimilation. And uh, if, if you really see the, the, the skill of um, improvement in NWP skill over the Indian region, you can see that uh, starting from 1999 up to 2022 or so, 21 or so, this is a substantial improvement, especially you can see the substantial improvement from almost from January 2012 and, and later to from January 2017 onwards. There's a substantial improvement, mainly because we try to as we try to introduce many new models with very high resolution and a lot of data has gone into the have gone in for data assimilation and also some improvement in physics, model physics, etc. So ultimately the, there's a substantial improvement in NWP skill over the Indian DJ. And this is a good example from when we migrated from T574 model to T1534 model. And there was substantial improvement in just two days uh, with the forecasting skill. And uh, for example, the, the, uh, the skill of the GFS T574 with the three day lead, it's, a, it's shown as a blue dotted dash line, is now extended up to five days. And uh, so now the same scale we can even achieve up to five days. So this is a substantial two days, uh, substantial improvement we have achieved by simply moving to from 1574 to 1534. But of course, with uh, a lot of data simulation and also improvement in physics. And this, I'll give you some few examples now from these models. Uh, this one monsoon heavy precipitation occurred in last year, 14 September 2021. The top uh, three panel, left hand side shows the uh, GPM rainfall uh, and the right hand shows with the, the probability of 98 percentile in the top and bottom is 95 percentile up to three days lead. And you can see that uh, beautifully the model is the ensemble prediction system is reproducing the probability, very high probability, one over Gujarat and one over eastern parts of central India. And this is another example of last year, uh, December, th that was December 2021, Chen Chennai region was. Uh, uh, affected by heavy rainfall and a lot of casualties. And uh, this also, this of the ensemble system could provide some kind of a signal for uh, extremes, uh, extreme rainfall over this region, even up to three days in advance. And this is a, a, a beautiful story of uh, Kerala rain. You must be, you all may be remembering 2018 and 19, we had uh, consecutively two years, we had uh, heavy rains and floods and a lot of casualties. The top one shows 18 and the bottom one shows the 19. And the blue line shows the absolute rainfall for different dates. And, um, and the first one is for one 
standard deviation and climatology plus one standard deviation. And second one is climatology plus two standard deviation, and, uh, and the right one is climatology plus three standard deviation. You can see in the first year 2018, the model could give up some kind of probabilities for one standard deviation, extreme rainfall, but uh, two and three, there's nothing, no signal. Whereas in the 2019 case, even in two standard deviation, there was a signal of extreme rainfall and also to up to three, three standard deviation. There's some, some, some kind of indication, even though, even though there are small shift in the days of extreme rainfall. So the, the, the extended range prediction system is giving, providing a very useful information about the probabilities of extreme rains over India. And this is a deterministic forecast, but it's from four kilometer NCMR WF model. This is of uh, Uttarakhand rainfall recently. And uh, the, the top uh, left one is uh, observed and remaining are forecast. You can say day one, day two, day three. And uh, of course, the model was picking up good rains, but only thing is a little over prediction over uh, specific, specific regions. And uh, IMD's uh, tropical cyclone forecasts are well known, and uh, India is well known for now more most accurate uh, tiger cyclone forecast for last many years, and uh, starting from tiger cyclone Filin. And uh, this is a typical example of Humphen, which caused uh, May 2020. And the, the, the story goes, uh, the story clearly says that the ensemble prediction system gave a better kind of a forecast for its track as well as the land port. And um, then a deterministic focus. So ensemble prediction system is really providing useful uh, information or useful hints about the, uh, in, uh, the, the tropical cyclone tracks as well as uh, uh, the, the landfall. So the improvement in our uh, tropical cyclone forecast, of course, it has uh, it has a lot of different reasons for that. And one one major reason could be the improvement in the models. An adoption of uh, we are we adopted a very high resolution model with a lot of data simulation that 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 we are providing a lot of important guidance for tropical cyclone forecast. Plus, IMD also using their own skill for improving their forecast. And um, uh, even landfall is uh, for Amphan case it was up to 10 kilometer error only up to 60 hours in advance. That's a very uh, remarkable achievement in terms of cyclone forecast. And, uh, and we also introduced uh, during uh, last few years, we introduced the heat wave forecast. Heat waves are very important in, in the country. And what we try to do is we started with a seasonal forecast of probabilities of uh, heat waves. Then we started uh, introducing extended range forecast, then short range forecast. So in the different time scale, we started uh, kind of a seamless kind of uh, forecast. We started implementing and very, what we found is very successful. And uh, heat wave forecasts are very skillful forecast, we could do it even up to five to six days, sometimes even one week before we could do, uh, achieve it. And this is a good example of law. this year, March 2022. March is too early to get a heat wave, but this year, March, we had a heat wave, and this model, the model could really predict this kind of uh, heat waves, which is occurring too early in the season. And uh, this is a good example. So heat wave forecasts are pretty good, and because of heat wave forecasts, many state governments are now coming up with the heat wave action plans, and which they give it to the people, and we are able to save precious lives, many lives. As the death of the cost due to heat waves is basically is in, uh, decreasing with the time. And another important application is uh, the quantitative precipitation forecast for river basins. The river ba river based flood is flood is another important major extreme uh, uh, kind of a disaster, natural disasters occurring over the uh, country. And uh, so this is the left hand side is the absorbed rainfall on 27th August 2020. And if you see the top panel is a forecast for different five days. And you can see that after three days or two, after three days, there's not much skill because when you do a bias, bias correction of the model, it gives you a lot of information even up to even in five days before that a kind of a heavy rainfall probabilities or heavy rainfall uh, occurrence over that, uh, sorry, the river basins. It's the upper Mahadevi basin. And uh, so this forecast, now this forecast guidance are, we, are, we are giving to guidance is given to Central Water Commission who will be using it, this information for issuing flood forecast for river basins. So very successful story, how our modeling, NWB modeling system has really improved and we are able to give quantitative precipitation forecast. I'm not saying everything is perfect. There are gray areas which I'm not uh, really highlighting, but I should accept there are a lot of gray areas where we need to improve. 
and I will uh, briefly I'll mention cyclone warning forecast. We have improved substantially, and heavy rainfall warning. As you can see, the skill is uh, probability of detection is going up. Um, uh, the the false alarm rates are coming down, and so it's a substantial improvement. Heavy rainfall warning skill, and even detection of thunderstorms in even 24 hours before is a high probability of 0.86 or so. And even three days, uh, three hours before using uh, uh, using models as well as like, sorry the uh, Doppler weather radars also has improved. And heavy rain, so heat wave warning skill, as I told that substantially even up to five days before we are able to predict uh, heat waves very accurately. And another application is for the energy application. And we also all of us know that we are um, India is pumping a lot of money in wind as well as solar energy. So this is the one product which we are generating for the energy sector. Different companies are asking for these products and both IATM as well as uh, NCMRWF for providing this kind of very accurate forecast. Not very accurate forecast, a forecast, but then a lot of um, issues. Uh, first of all, especially our solar energy during cloudy skies, etc. Uh, but then uh, we are trying to improve further and uh, both solar as well as wind energy applications are uh, plenty. And thunderstorm process, we recently we introduced about a few years back, 2018. 18, we had a huge thunderstorm activity. Uh, at least some thousands of people died. And uh, which was, it was it caused a lot of um, um, uh, uh, concern among the government, public, and uh, and also the policy makers. Then finally, we introduced uh, we tried to improve our thunderstorm projects. We introduced uh, thunderstorm detection detect uh, detectors around the country. We have about more than 100 uh, around 100 detector thunderstorm detectors are in the country now. Using that, we can really monitor how thunderstorm activities or lightning activities are happening. We developed a mobile app. We also improved our model forecast. We tried to adapt very high resolution models. And this is a good example of uh, uh, 2019, uh, 6th of April. And the top one on the left hand side, top one shows the thunderstorm activity where it happened. And the bottom one, and as well as right one, are the uh, different kind of forecast, different kind of guidance of thunderstorm activity, which clearly depicts the uh, occurrence of thunderstorm. And uh, another important application in the short to medium range forecast is the quality of air quality forecast. As all of us know, Delhi is very well known for poor quality air quality, and uh, Prime Minister of his wanted us to develop a air quality warning system, air quality uh, warning system for Delhi, and which we could uh, do it. Now we have two systems, one based on NGAR, uh, with the support from NGAR, with the collaboration from NGAR, and another one is using Finnish Meteorological Office. And we have two different um, uh, modeling system, and both of them are doing extremely well. This is a good example of how the IATM was collaborating with the NCAR, and this is the IATM system. And we have uh, we have a regional model of 10 kilometer, which is downscaled up to 400 meter only for Delhi region, and uh, and uh, reliable forecasts are being generated on air quality over Delhi. And in addition to that. Uh, in addition to that, we also provide a kind of a decision support system for Delhi. And uh, during uh, winter, you all, all of us know that uh, Delhi is uh, Delhi airport is very uh, uh, is affected by fog events and many many disruptions of the aircraft um, uh, flights etc. happen. And so we they wanted a special forecast for winter. So we have three different systems are now in operational, and 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 um, aviation industry is uh, making use of this one is air quality which is general Delhi public and also decision making system for Delhi and also in the winter fog experience. And um, uh, another important achievement made by the Mansoor mission is uh, the beautiful data sets, regional uh, reanalysis data set which uh, developed, which was developed with the collaboration from UK Meta Office. And it's the Indian Mansoor data simulation and analysis called IMDA. It's a paper is available, data are available, and I think it's of, of, of 42 years of data of 12 kilometers. That's on resolution. I think people should uh, be encouraged that people should make use of this data for their research. It's a beautiful contribution from Mansoor Mission. Another is the Bombay flood warning system. And uh, earlier we developed a system for Chennai. The similar system is now developed for Bombay. And uh, this is this model has uh, different components. It, it makes you make use of rainfall, how much it is received, and how the river flows. There are a lot of small small lakes there in Bombay. And also, there, there could be a kind of a tidal waves uh, coming inside the city. So all these components are taken care, of and it's a full flood dynamical prediction system has been developed for Bombay. We have issues for giving uh, accurate weather forecast, sorry, rainfall forecast for the Bombay region. 
which we are addressing. We are running a very high resolution ensemble of player, four kilometer model forecast are uh, giving us inputs to the system, but there are issues. There are issues. We should accept that there are issues. And uh, another, another important achievements we made is the uh, observational campaigns. Uh, we, uh, we did not only believe in improving models. We also believed that observations are very important, especially intense observational campaigns. So we, there was our own Indo-UK monsoon mission campaign. Uh, I saw I saw Andrew Andrew in uh, in the panel. So Andrew was Andrew Trainer was also uh, the main person who was from the UK um, side, and he has written a small article in Cliver Exchange in November 2020. I think we should read. And uh, I understand there are plenty of good research papers have come. It had three important components. One is on interaction of convection convective organization and monsoon precipitation in campus, and there was an aerosol experiment called Swami. And a boundary layer experiment over Bay of Bengal is called Bobil. Another experiment was done also into a US monsoon campaign that just before this into UK. It started just before that. And uh, the, the primary purpose of this campaign was to understand the ocean mixing process over the North Bay of Bengal. And very high resolution measurements were, uh, were obtained, and there were a lot of modeling work also be that. Under the Indo UK monsoon mission program, we could bring the UK meta of his uh, jet aircraft, uh, research aircraft. And we could do a lot of aircraft observation for the first time in this country. After the after probably 1979 monarchs, we could uh, do that. And the new experiment, new experiment we are now proposing joint experiment is called ECMAT. ECAM SAT is called enhancing knowledge of the Arabian Sea marine environment through science and environment training. And two I, I'll, I'll stop with the two more slides. And um, as all of us know that we also need to improve the physics of the model. So we need a lot of observations of uh, cloud uh, phys physical processes, land surface process, cloud process, etc. So we are going to launch a, a research test bed over Bhopal. Bhopal is over central India where all these monsoon lows and depressions form and pass on through this. It's a very beautiful site where we can put all kind of instruments and take observations. And this is going to be an international research test bed facility. And already workers, uh, we have found, we got some land um, uh, thanks to Madhya uh, Pradesh government, and we have started putting the instrument. Another two years, this uh, facility will come up as an international facility, and I urge all the I request all the international scientists to make use of this uh, facility for understanding the monsoon physical processes, and uh, all this data will be shared internationally. And another investment we are making is for urban um, uh, flooding or Mumbai. We are starting a very high resolution uh, rainfall network over that region and including we are going to set up full intense surface observations, especially ARGs of uh, maybe 200, 250 ARGs. In addition to that, we will be setting up four weather radars, X-band four, small, small scale, small range weather radars and put together, we will be able to generate rainfall values, rainfall values of every 15 minutes at every five kilometer or so. So this is the uh, dream project that, uh, of course, small, there, are, there are small delays because of the COVID, et cetera. But by next year, uh, this year, Mansoor, uh, this network will be fully operational. And with this net, uh, observations, we will be able to understand more about what kind of uh, urban flooding can happen in Bombay. And along with the flood, uh, Bombay flood warning system, this, this, this data will be very, very useful. So with that, so this kind of uh, initiatives also, Ministry of Science have launched. And with this, all these things, observations, modeling, everything, I hope that our our weather prediction capabilities improved a lot and will substantially will improve further. With this, I will stop here. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajivan. You gave a very uh, nice picture of the monsoon mission developments made in all front: data revision, data assimilation modeling and operational forecasting. Now the presentation is open for questions, uh, discussions. I don't find any uh, chat question. Anybody can raise hand for a couple of questions. I don't any find anything on the chat. Uh, only one uh, no, I don't, I don't see. Yeah, there is one from Andrew Turner. Yeah, yeah, but that's, uh, I'm just trying to read it. Mr. Rajivan is presently working as the, that is on the, uh, on Dr. Rajivan 
production, uh, then Andrew Tanner, I next, no, I don't see anything on the chat. On my, my chat, I don't find, he's there, I think he can ask. Uh, sir, one question is there from uh, uh, Andy Turner. Yeah, uh, maybe Andy, I'll, yeah. Can, sir, I, can I speak the question? I can say, yeah, he can, he can ask, yeah. Because okay, I, don't uh, I, was, I was just going to ask, what, what does uh, uh, Professor Rajivan think are the, the key research priorities that maybe we are, we are not doing enough of already or um, perhaps not even doing at all? You know, what, what, what are the priorities that we don't already have projects working on? What was what was the question? Uh, what are the key research priorities um, going forward? Do you think? Yeah, yeah. Key uh, research priorities: uh, improving model physics. That could be one, and improvement in uh, data simulation. And another important aspect which we neglected, we have we have not been doing it, is the model, the the post processing of model output. We all also we always thought that model output is the actual forecast. So we the for the general public, IMD has to IMD has to do a much intelligent post processing of data NWP model outputs before they can make it a product to give it to the public. So uh, so IMD is going to launch a kind of a post processing initiate research initiative using a, a artificial intelligence and machine language techniques. So that, so we can derive much more uh, useful information from model output instead of uh, using rather rather raw output. So that is one area where IMD will be concentrating more, and IMD will be establishing more and more observations everywhere, including more another 20 Doppler weather radars are going to come. And we are we are not so good in model physics. We're doing, uh, for example, very very hardly a couple of people are working in model physics, especially physical parameterization schemes. We need to really do much more work on model physics. And we also need to adapt uh, uh, model model techniques, uh, parameters, techniques, stochastic process, etc., into the model. This is the one area where we will be working on that. So, plenty of work to be done. I uh, I don't find any other something uh, problem with my chat box. I think uh, somebody has uh, noted here that. Uh, yeah, and returners. Now I see. I now I can see and returner. Somebody, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, that is uh, Terry Lafort. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I trained IMD forecasters in 2020, and I can attest the great improvements that IMD has achieved in one decade for elaborating and delivering useful information. So it is an appreciation for the uh, IMD. Okay. I think uh, because of shortage of time, yeah, do you have to say anything now? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, so now because of shortage of time, we can't really continue. So I thank uh, Dr. Rajivan, let us thank Dr. Rajivan for his very elaborate thank presentation. You. And now we go for the next uh, presenters, next speaker, uh, Dr. King Bao, who is a professor in the Institute of Atmospheric Physics in the Chinese Academy of sciences. He obtained BSc in Metrology and uh, Nanjing in the Institute of Metrology in 2002 and PhD in Metrology Institute of Atmospheric Physics, Chinese Academy of Science. Then uh, since 1928 as a Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Institute of Atmospheric Physics, Chinese Academy of Science. His research topics are primarily in climate system modeling sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction and seamless prediction. He is the recipient of uh, many prestigious awards like uh, 2011 G. Ibing Young Scientist Award, 2012 IAP Science Innovative Award, 2014 uh, Tsinghua University in Sports Group Computational Art Science Talent Award, 2015 a uh, esteemed paper prize and uh, IAP Science Innovative Award 2016, Tian Star Awards of Excellence Application. Uh, Dr. Bao will speak on the monsoon information and prediction for societal benefit. Dr. Bao, please, on seamless prediction system.
Uh, you have thank to you. share your can share your yeah. slides now. Yeah, thank you. We, we can yeah. see that. Please, please continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, it's great, my great pleasure to introduce our prediction system and some application in Acer Mengzong region. I'm Qin Bao from IAP. Here is the outline of my talk. First is the introduction. Uh, as we know, the seamless prediction is uh, covered a lot of the time scale from the day, week, month, season, or even many year, longer time. They have a lot of uh, application field that focus on this many time scale. But as we know, there are a lot of gaps between the traditional prediction system, like uh, the S2S is fill the gap between the weather prediction and the climate prediction, and another uh, gap between the uh, interannual and the interdecadal prediction. That means the seamless prediction may cover many gaps between the previous uh, prediction system. Uh, as we know, uh, what are we going to predict? We are not predict one year later the temperature or uh, the uh, the precipitation, but we should focus on the extreme part like tropical cyclone, heat wave, drought, and flood. Okay, this is the current operational subsidy to decadal prediction system uh, already noticed in WMO. Because uh, first, uh, you look at subsignal prediction system. There already, there already be 11 prediction group. We are, fortunately, we are the uh, last one to participate in the S2S project. There are 13 seasonal prediction system. I think most of operation, oper uh, operation, uh, operational uh, center, they have their own uh, seasonal prediction system. But in IPCC or CME, the 15 centers, they submit their decadal prediction. I think the decadal part will be renewed every uh, IPCC report, maybe five or eight years. But for Met Office, they renew their results every year. Opportunity and challenge for subsidy to decade. I think in current world, especially in China, we have quite good uh, HPC. That means we can run the model with uh, very good uh, computing resources. But the challenge part is that we need a good models because there are a lot of uncertainty risks from like the cloud convection or uh, topography issues, even with the biggest. Uh, uh, computing uh, resources, we cannot solve like presentation or uh, extreme part. That means we have opportunity, but challenge is still there. Okay, here's a, a climate system model I'm going to introduce today. Uh, it's called F goals, F2 versions. In this climate system model, we produce several IPCC or CMIC uh, experiments. Uh, we propose a new Scheme we call it the RCP is scale wellness uh, convective convection scheme. We try to resolve convective precipitation uh, in uh, the model uh, physical package. It's a fully coupled model, including not only atmosphere components, also ocean part, sea ice, and the land. We use FV3 dynamic core because it's running very fast. Okay, and you look at the model performance, and this scheme is quite good at the extreme part, especially over the south slope of uh, the Tibetan plateau regions. So if you look at extreme precipitation from the uh, observations state from the station data, it's up to 150 uh, millimeter per day. Extreme parts model give did a pretty good job to capture this. Extreme part. And then look at the MGO, another important extreme uh, phenomenon. Uh, we look at the middle one. I adopt the fi uh, figures from uh, the recent publications. Uh, this model actually is a previous version from our CMIP file. 
uh, without this RCP scheme, you see the MGOs propagate to the wrong direction. But in CMIP6, recently we submitted, uh, we participate CMIP6 model, uh, CMIP6 uh, experiments with ICP scheme, you see the uh, eastward propagation of MGOs quite close to the observation, observation, especially over the maritime continent regions. Model show quite strong signal to this propagation events. And we also evaluate the extreme precipitation over land uh, using the station data set. If you look at this uh, recent publications, uh, we check the uh, stream presentation over land and compare with the CMIP5 models, and this is station part. That means the model did a pretty good job to capture the per, uh, extreme persuasion over land, and this is uh, uh, a time uh, this is extreme from the model. This is from other, the other uh, CMIP5 models, up panel is from your analysis, and this is uh, some satellite product. Another extreme events is diurnal cycles. I'm panel is from GPM hourly satellite data set. We see a lot of strong diurnal cycles. The middle panel is from our one degree model, and the lower panel is from our quarter degree model. It's clear to see that even in middle uh, low cost resolution model, uh, the it's, the diurnal cycle of the presentation is quite close to observation, but the amplitude or stream part is not as good as a uh, 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 higher resolution model. If you look at the monsoon region, both low resolution and high resolution uh, show quite strong signal over the land so at the middle night peak of the diurnal cycle from both. Uh, Low resolution and high resolution show same kind of signal uh, compared with the GPM satellite data. Okay, another extreme part is tropical cycle. So you look at uh, our one degree model, quarter degree model, show quite similar signal to the IB track. If you look at the other uh, one degree model, it cannot give quite reasonable. Uh, tropical cycle. That means our scale will convection scheme work quite well. And we also check the duration of the tropical cycle, especially over the West Pacific and North Indian Ocean. From observations, usually the tropical cycle is 10 up to eight days. For quarter degree model, we have almost eight days. For one degree model, we have six day duration. It's quite comparable to observation. Over the Indian Ocean, both low resolution and the high resolution are compared with, uh, compar quite comparable with the uh, IP track operation data. With this kind of uh, model, we are set up a seamless prediction system. We call it FGOS F2 version 1.3. And this model, we use only one degree because we're trying to see uh, computing results have more ensemble members. So we have very simple initialization like mapping from atmosphere and ocean signal. We use time lag as ensemble approach. We have uh, four ensemble members for real forecast and the real time forecast have 16 ensemble members. We're our uh, 20 year refocus and we start um, refocus frequency is daily. And this prediction we call S2D or subsidian to decadal prediction system. In subsidial part, we predict uh, the, uh, the fully in two, almost two months, and for decadal part, it's covered from one month to uh, 10 years. And this operational uh, system. We call it green one because it saves a lot of electricity. We use only six, uh, 16 nodes cluster uh, HPC. We have a daily S2S, daily signal prediction. 
with two in the more member, and monthly uh, we run the Arcado uh, card with two in the more members. And then here we have a, a website to remove this result. I'm not going to the details, but uh, this result also share with some operational center, like they use our MGO uh, for uh, their operational purpose. And we also have the sub-seasonal tropical cyclone. Also, we are only one degree model, but if you look at the daily result, you can see the tropical cyclone is clearly captured in this system. And we, uh, we also predict the following one month and two months lead for uh, the tropical cyclone frequency. And for the uh, signal prediction part, just like regular signal prediction system, we predict a linear and uh, temperature or precipitation anomaly, and of course, monsoon circulations. And we also uh, predict uh, the signal prediction of tropical cycle. If you look at the recent publications, we evaluate models performance in terms of uh, Seasonal, uh, scale, seasonal predicting scale of tropical cyclones model uh, quite good uh, skill to capture the uh, anomaly or uh, variation of the tropical cycle. Uh, we also check the real time results during the recent uh, three years. And, and the right panel, you, sh you see that model did a good, very good job to capture the frequency, but uh, as I showed in previous slides, the model failed to uh, we predict the intensity because it's only one degree model. That means the intensity is not good, but for the, uh, the, the frequency is quite good. And then we also submit our result to CIS prediction networks every year. This is the result from 2019. 2019. Uh, these results, we not only uh, predict for the average, we also submit uh, the uh, two-dimensional CIs to uh, SIPN, and the result is quite encouraging. In this year, our result is even better than MME. And this is the first decade part. It's not only for operational purposes, it's also for research, because we, this is annual training the presentation in the next 10 years. So we want to know where can become drier, where, uh, where it's become uh, uh, wetter. Okay, uh, there are uh, so four parts I'm going to report some application in Asia Monsoon region. One of the most important applications is S2S. We submit results to uh, S2S project. And if you look at the news announcement from S2S project still, uh, in uh, last month, February 4th, is exactly the same day as Beijing Winter Olympic Games. So the 20 year refocus data set has add to S to S data set. And from last year, we are capable to share or send our real-time prediction. If anyone wants to look at the model results or this prediction, you can go to the S to S data bank and download the results. And uh, the advantage of the, uh, the good is that the summation of the, our model results is quite timely. I download this uh, plot from the S2S website. You see our summation is quite earlier than the other uh, prediction system. Another important thing is the skill. Uh, if, if we talk about S2S prediction, we have to report what is the performance of MGO. It's very important. Like this is like a uh, menu in signal prediction part. From research uh, paper, you can see that the, the previous prediction uh, usually have uh, about 23 or 24 days for uh, MGO. 
but European Center did a very good job. It's up to 30 day uh, prediction scale. We also check our uh, submission to S to S during the last uh, uh, for the uh, to check the data for the uh, V forecast, 20 year forecast. The prediction skill from the four ensemble members, four V forecast ensemble members, about 24 to 25 days. And this is the roaming square error of RMME1 and RMME2. And we also check the uh, ensemble methods because I, we noted that the European Center uses uh, 12 ensemble member. We only have four ensemble member, but we use time lag method to include more members from previous uh, days. And the, the prediction skill is up to, uh, it's increasing to 27 days in uh, the refocus. Without that means the more ensemble member can enhance the uh, prediction skill of MGO. And we also check the, uh, the individual case from this uh, retard analysis. You can see clearly that individual case for control runs, the MGO for European Center is up to 20 or 21. We check our individual uh, in demo members at prediction scale of MGO is about uh, uh, 18 days. That means we, we still have a lot of uh, uh, space to improve uh, the individual members of MGO in terms of MGO predictions. Okay. Another is that we are trying to use not only for research purpose, but we also share to uh, some uh, Asia countries like uh, uh, this prediction system is help or support for tanker uh, tank uh, fire in Sri Lanka. So if you still remember in 2020, there is tank out fire, but we share our predictions, especially for tropical cyclone, we report. We predict after two weeks, there is tropical cyclone cross from uh, South China Sea, more west of the reach of Bengal regions. And, and, kindly, uh, kindly wrap up. Kindly wrap up. It's time, time. Okay. Uh, here, uh, there is a last, uh, we also uh, share our report, uh, the or linear predictions for China, uh, multi-model ensemble methods. And so uh, this prediction in terms of seasonal time scale is good to uh, predict uh, a weak CP or linear events. They have, I wrote a paper to document this prediction. Also, uh, the model predicts quite good for maple winter drought. And we also uh, make outlook summer outlook for presentation in China due to time limit. I'm not going to detail. Just a uh, uh, go give quick look at the future depression. We are trying to use a stretched model to have the down scaling uh, up to kilometer to uh, to trying to have more detailed prediction from both uh, subsidian or even longer time scale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wow. Uh, is there any question on the chat box? No, I, I don't find. It's a very, very interesting talk on the developments up to the sub-seasonal to the Kedar. Any question from the audience? If there is no question, let us thank Professor Bao for his very interesting talk uh, on the sub seasonal to decadal prediction uh, in their goals. Uh, now I request the next uh, speaker, distinguished speaker, Dr. Shiogo Yueden. I saw him. Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, I hope. Uh, uh, thank you very yeah. much. So, uh, so, uh, Professor Chigo, you then, 
uh, and Vice Director of Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences of Kyoto University. He had been the professor of metrology of Kyoto University from 2002 to 2022. His major area research education are atmospheric dynamics, geophysical fluid dynamics, and climate dynamics. He won the 1992 hour Metrological Society of Japan for the study on general circulation of atmosphere and uh, theme leader of the stratosphere, stratosphere dynamical coupling in SPARG, SSG from 2005 to 2000, oh, so many hours on tropical convective system from 2016. And he has also served as the president of the IUGG, IAMS International Commission on the Middle Atmosphere from 2007 to 2011. He will speak on the modeling monsoon process, especially by the use of equatorial quasi biennial oscillation. Professor Jordan, please. Uh, you know that uh, 15 minutes we have its, uh, time limits. So 15 minutes you will present and a uh, couple of minutes will be there for question and answer. Thank you, Professor Jordan. Okay. Please, please continue. Thank you yeah. very much. Slides are visible. Uh, yeah. Professor Dash, thank you very much. Kind introduction. And can, can you see my slides or? Yeah, okay, yes, but yeah, it may not be the full screen. Okay, how about this? Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Pointer. Please okay. continue. Please Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry, this is not the talk of the new maker modeling studies, but uh, it's a fully uh, data analysis. But I hope uh, this could be a uh, interesting subject for uh, numerical moderators for the motivation of a new test bed of the possible uh, influence of the equatorial stratosphere particularly the equatorial qbo on the uh, tropical convection system and their organizations so i don't need to explain the monsoon itself yeah this is a monsoon symposium <laughs> workshop but uh, i think that this this uh, ship uh, uh, illustrations are uh, very good way to overview the monsoon systems. This is just a composite difference of the DJF minus June July August stream uh, precipitation, and you can see the seasonal difference and uh, importance of the land ocean contrast. And my main uh, subject. Uh, main interesting is the stratosphere to dynamic coupling. Yeah. And these years, I focused in the coupling in the tropics. And we started some years ago, uh, SATIO TCS. It stands the stratospheric and tropospheric influence on tropical convective systems. And uh, last year, we published a review paper in General Metrical Society of Japan and that are uh, influence the stratosphere on the tropical troposphere. And this is one of the important illustrations. And this describes the three pathways of the cubial influence to the troposphere. And today's subject is the vertical downward tropospheric influence. But at the same time, there are two other pathways through the subtropical jet. And also the Holton time relationship, stratospheric pathway. and Northern annular mode to possibly influence the tropospheric uh, with and climate. And recently, we, uh, we published a like uh, review paper on the okay. influence of QBO on the specific um, MGO. And this is also the illustration like and uh, two panels uh, uh, QBO easterly phase and also QBO the westerly phase. And there is a systematic change of the temperature and the height of the tropopause and also the static stability. Uh, in the eastern phase of the QBO, call the higher tropopause and reduce the stratification. And that influence the dynamics of the modern Julian oscillation. So eastern phase of QBO increase the modern Julian oscillation strength and activity. And the propagation speed is slower 
and uh, increase the image of predictability. And uh, you can see this review that includes over 100 differences for these five years or so. And you can use this uh, linkage with, to see the whole the paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so this is a, yeah. a summary of, uh, of the target. In the in the tropos, tropical troposphere, there are multi-scale interactions, the moist convection, and uh, they are interseasonal to internal variation. And there are two clear periodic forcing and response, diana variation, and also annual variation we call monsoon here. And it's a large societal, I'm sorry, yeah, it's free. Uh, impacts in multiple time scales. And there is a stratospheric component to modulate possible modulation of these variations. And uh, MGO is uh, this kind of uh, interaction in the troposphere, but uh, Son et al. introduced the modulation of this by QBO. This is a new aspect of the stratosphere troposphere coupling. And uh, today's talk is uh, this application is uh, modulation of the monsoon by the QBO. And uh, yeah, we analyze only the neutral lens period and we separate boreal summer and austral summer. And we, we use uh, precipitation data and also the circulation field and 40 years data. And this is a zonal wind, zonal wind anomaly for the analysis period. And you can see the very clear signal in the QBO in the lower part of the stratosphere. And here's the monsoon climatology. And the first slide shows the GPCP precipitation and horizontal wind at 850 hectopascal all year at the top. And second is the June, July, August, DJF. And the bottom one is the, the difference between the two seasons. And uh, these columns, the zonal wind, zonal wind and the precipitation. And if we look at the difference, you can see the very anti-symmetric profile in zonal wind field of the U wind and precipitation and the symmetric for the W wind. And this is a real uh, horizontal distribution. Asymmetry. Similarly, yeah, we can see such kind of climate uh, composite difference between two seasons in OLR specific humidity, uh, similar to the precipitation, and also the mean sea level pressure SST, horizontal wind divergence near the surface, and vertical motion in mid tropos. And we can see a similar uh, monsoon patterns, but the individual quantity show uh, specific features. Particularly, for example, the divergence field, you can see a very contrast distributions uh, relative to other fields. And also the north-south contrast. Okay. So that's the background. And this is the main subject of the equatorial QBO and its influence. And we made a UFO analysis and over 95% are explained by the first two component along the equator. So in the lower stratosphere, 70 to 10 hexapascal. And this is a phase plot of the PC1, PC2 space. And uh, there are three colors and Black dot shows the nutrients years. So we also use this. And uh, we divide eight phases. So for each 45 degrees, uh, phase one, two, three through eight. 
and this is a part color profile that zona means zona wind uh, for eight phases. One through four is a red, and five through eight. Are, and the dash line is a composite difference with the opposite phase. So you can see the downward progression of the phase, and particularly we focus on the phase four and eight, and the largest difference at 50 hectopascal, and also the significant difference even in the troposphere, although the difference is very small, but statistically significant. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a composite difference between the opposite QBO phase. This is a difference between uh, westerly phase at hect 50 hectopascal minus uh, Easterly phase, phase four minus phase eight. Uh, precipitation mean sea level pressure wind, ORR, uh, W wind, specific humidity, and the hot there is a significant areas. And the Z uh, rectangle uh, shows the significant areas, and the Z is a superposition. And this particular phase in Boreal Sum, uh, there are significant in the mostly in the along the equator and also the northern and the southern hemispheres around here. And this is the composite difference along the equator. And here's the climatology uh, in this uh, longitude. And you can see the climatologically uh, worker circulation, but uh, Around there, we have a significant composite difference. Intensification, the walker circulation, much better atmosphere, and enhanced precipitation or reduced precipitation in phase eight. And that constant the significant overall around here, uh, mostly, I think, the, over the maritime continent to uh, Papua New Guinea. And this is a subtropical influence around uh, Japan in the same boreal summer, June, July, August. And uh, this is a climatology, and this is not a composite difference, but the phase eight, phase four composite in the middle, and phase eight in the right. And you can see the uh, intensification of uh, Bony high in phase eight and uh, intensification of the saturation. And there is a dipole of the dry air, this area, and the wet is the western part of Japan. Uh, so, a kind of a seesaw pattern, also change in the seesaw patterns. And this is uh, directly related to the difference in the tropical and also the, around the Philippines, uh, seesaw patterns. On the other hand, in the Austral summer, DJF, we don't have much uh, significant response along the equator, but uh, mid-latitude, both northern and southern hemisphere. And the, the most important or interesting is the Atlantic Ocean with the much strong signals. And uh, so again, this is a, a climatology of precipitation and mean level pressure and horizontal wind. And uh, you can see the, this kind of uh, stationary uh, loss patterns or uh, cyclonic uh, features in climatology in the Northern winter DJF, but uh, uh, phase eight, there is an intensification and the elongation of the strong wind regions. And you can see the contrast. And also, there is a moderation or influence of the precipitation 
and here is the dipoles. If you compare to the phase four and the phase area, there is an increase of the precipitation around this and a decrease of the precipitation here. And these kind of features are associated with the circulation patterns. And uh, I think uh, there are some other examples with a different phase of the QBO. This is a different phase one minus phase five and the boreal summer, and again, the, here, here along the equator. And also, this phase, there is a significant difference around the Indian monsoon regions. Okay. And this is the opposite, austral summer uh, between the phase one minus phase eight. And you can see other locations. And, uh, I'll stop here to, to, to show the detailed result of the analysis, and here's my summary of my talk. And uh, by using uh, global data of 40 years, uh, climatology the global system is summarized, uh, specifically for the neutral and so period, excluding the influence of El Nino or La Nina and uh, clear signals, the zonal asymmetric component, and also the non-zonal asymmetric component with the contrast between the two hemispheres. And uh, we introduced eight QBO phases by the UF analysis of the D season as zonal means zonal wind in the lower stratosphere. And we applied the student T test to show the significance of the difference. Even though yeah, 40 years is not so long, so there are some limitations with the sample size in the same phase and season, in some of the phase of season. And the QBO modulation of global monsoon system is investigated, specifically for Boreal summer, June, July, August, and also the Austral summer, DJF, uh, separately. And we showed precipitation is the proxy and also circulation phase, all of these, these are consistent and significant composite difference, particularly between the QBO phase four and uh, uh, phase eight. And uh, this is uh, character with the lower zonal wind at 50 hectopascal for each. And also the another phase, phase one minus phase five. And uh, interest in the several pathways, as pointed uh, here in the ETR, uh, we gave an uh, example of the equ equatorial pathway uh, in associated with the weakening of the Walker circulation and the reduction of the precipitation over the Western maritime continent, particularly in phase eight compared to the phase four. Uh, Subsequent pathways, we can give an example of the intensification of the western side of Ogasara High and um, Japan and uh, modulation of the pressure system and also the precipitation dipoles over the western part of Japan. And uh, the opposite season, uh, Boreal Winter DJF, they have a uh, significant. Hello, question for Charlie Nihichi. Okay, yeah. uh, about the North Atlantic. So I think that there is a wide variety of interesting um, yeah, to be confined. Okay, thank you very much. This is all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yaden. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very, very detailed analysis of these uh, eight phases of PBO with the uh, Indian monsoon. Thank you I so hope, much. Very, very thank interesting. You very much. Yeah, I hope some information for the moderators. <laughs> yeah, there are several questions in mind, but uh, you know the constraints of time, and we are yeah, really sorry, that sorry by that. presenting uh, by presenting a limited time. Thank you so much. I don't find any uh, the flow. This uh, presentation is open for questions and discussions, but I don't find anything on the chat box. Anybody wants to raise at least one point? Okay, yeah. 
Takayubu. You carry Takayubu. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much very for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have one question on why uh, the equatorial difference is found only in the boreal summer, but not in the Austrian summer. I'm sorry, <laughs> this is a totally a uh, statistical uh, analysis and uh, weak point is uh, interpretation, particularly the dynamic interpretations. Yes. <laughs> um, there, there is a large uh, seasonal or month-to-month -month variations. And also the phase of the QBO. So I'm sorry, currently I have no answer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let us thank uh, Professor Yueden and uh, we'll quickly go to the next speaker, uh, Professor Yuei Takaya. Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to certainly his introduction he has personally questioned me uh, so that you get adequate time. Uh, he's, uh, he, he can read, uh, he's the editor of uh, scientific editor letters, uh, SOLA, and he's senior researcher in metallurgical research to Japan Metallurgical Agency. Uh, Professor Takaya, please. I don't want to uh, take more time on this. Please start your sharing your slides. I'm yeah. sharing my slides. Do you see my screen yeah. okay? Yeah. Give me okay? See. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm Yuhei Takaya with Meteorological Research Institute. Uh, it's, I'm honored to uh, give a presentation on the sub seasonal to seasonal prediction of the Asian summer monsoon. And uh, in this talk, I uh, update the current status and discuss the future direction. So after the short introduction of the data archives for the sub -season to seasonal studies uh, to facilitate the S2S prediction study, I present some results of the uh, perform evaluation of the performance of the uh, S2S prediction systems. And uh, focusing on the dominant drivers for the uh, drivers for the agents of a monsoon variability and the representation of their responses in the models. And I will discuss the future challenges and give a summary. So, uh, so nowadays, a lot of with the a lot of efforts, the, we have uh, several data, data archives for the S2S prediction studies. Before seasonal prediction, we have the WWRP, WCRP, sub seasonal to seasonal prediction project, S2S archive. We heard about this, and which includes the 12 models. And in addition, we have a sub seasonal experiment, the sub X database archives, which include the seven models from the uh, North American uh, uh, modeling centers. And for the seasonal predictions, we have several uh, archives as well, and the, the WCRP Climate System Historical Forecast Project, SCHFP, and the North American uh, Multi Model Ensemble, NMME. In addition, uh, there is uh, uh, Copernic Climate Change Services, C3S, uh, which is uh, they are uh, all available for uh, really available. So uh, in this talk, I will uh, present some uh, evaluation results. Uh, this is a part of uh, our work in the WIGSHIP initiative. Uh, this slide just show the precipitation climatology in summer in, in seasonal prediction models. Uh, on the right, we see the CHFP models and the, uh, on the, uh, on the Right uh, on the left, we see the CHFP, and on the right, we see the, the C3S. And here I'm showing the GPCP observations. And the models uh, roughly uh, reasonably capture the uh, uh, observed climatology, but of course, we know that the model always have the biases. And uh, here, uh, to illustrate the biases, I'm showing the C3S uh, much model ensemble. Uh, uh, the precipitation biases of the C3S uh, against the GPCP observations. 
And we uh, see the excessive rainfall bias over the uh, tropical western North Pacific and North Indian Ocean, and the deficient uh, rainfall bias around the coastal East Asia and, and South Asia. And the, these biases are persisting, are persistent. We know that there is uh, persistent biases, and, and these biases, the CS3S model and the CMIP models uh, share uh, these kind of bias. But we see uh, some progress in the past. Uh, here I'm showing the pattern creation of precipitation climatology uh, in summer over the Asian summer uh, monsoon region, uh, the box here. And basically, uh, this slide shows the latest models, the C3S models have higher uh, uh, pattern correlations of the precipitation uh, compared with the uh, models, the older models in C3, uh, CHFP. And almost all of the models have uh, C3S models have the higher uh, pattern correlations than the median of the correlation of the uh, CHFP models. And this is good. But the participating uh, models uh, institute are different from CHFP and C3S. So I extracted the models of the same institute. Here I'm showing the Metal France, JMA, ECMWF, UK Met Office, and NORA. Uh, in the uh, C3S and CHFP. Again, we confirm that the, uh, the, we see a decade of progress uh, uh, in, in terms of the representation of the precipitation climatology. And the pattern creation of the climatological precipitation over the uh, Asian summer monsoon region exceeds 0.8 in some models. So uh, we are happy with these results. And this slide shows the point wise uh, temporal correlation skill for uh, JJA precipitation. Uh, in this kind of exercise, dependence of the uh, skill scores on ensemble size makes it difficult to compare the skill of the different systems. So uh, here I'm showing the estimated correlation skill of infinite member ensemble following the MAPI 1988. So we can compare the skills. I'm showing the 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 skill of the multimodal ensemble of C3S. And the patterns uh, are uh, consistent with each other. And again, uh, this slide shows the area averages of temporal correlations uh, for uh, JJA precipitation over the Asian summer monsoon region. And again, we see a uh, uh, decade of progress and uh, uh, almost all of the uh, C3S models on the right uh, have the uh, higher average correlation than the median of the CHFP uh, models. And the, uh, this is the similar plot as I showed before. And the, we see a decade of progress in terms of uh, in, uh, predicting the uh, interannual variability of JJ precipitation. Uh, in C3S and CHFP. And the, uh, I know that uh, there have been a lot of efforts to achieve this, uh, uh, this improvement. Uh, so I would like to uh, congratulate uh, the, those who contribute to the model development. And, and uh, we can clearly see the, uh, uh, the progress in the last decades because the the C3S is the latest system, and the CHFP has the uh, uh, models decade ago. So uh, the next question is where we can predict, or the uh, where is the uh, where are the predictable regions of JJ precipitation. What I'm showing here is the number of models that have expected uh, creation skills exceed 0.3. And uh, in the CHFP and C3S model, and we can identify the potentially predictable regions. For example, uh, tropical western North Pacific, uh, maritime continent, uh, Arabian Sea, uh, eastern and western Indian Ocean, and Ganges region, South uh, 
south part of the uh, Indian subcontinent and central China to Japan and Meiyu region and coastal region of Indonesia. And we see the consistent uh, results in the CHFP and C3S. So we expect to the uh, skillful prediction over these regions. So let's move on to the dominant drivers for the uh, agent summer monsoon variability. Uh, this is uh, just showing the uh, dominant climate drivers the, for the sub-season to season predictions. The, uh, the S2S predictability arises from multiple sources, including the MGO or IOD, Equino, or ENSO and uh, Indian Western Pacific Ocean capacity model. So uh, this slide shows the uh, coherent, uh, dominant coherent variability of the uh, agent summer monsoon. Uh, namely, I computed the uh, singular value decomposition analysis for SST and precipitation over uh, this uh, region. And the, uh, I'm showing here uh, the heterogeneous correlation maps of the SVS, SVD analysis for uh, SST and precipitation. The colors uh, shows, uh, indicate the precipitation, uh, correlation of the uh, pre precipitation and contours indicate the SST. And the first mode in, uh, represents the nth mode uh, with uh, the warm uh, positive anomalies over here and the active conviction here and then uh, suppressed conviction here. And the, the second mode represents the Indian uh, Western Pacific Ocean capacity mode, which features the warm SST conditions over the Indian Ocean and South China Sea, and the active combustion over the Indian Ocean and the suppressed combustion over the tropical Western Pacific. And this, these uh, two dominant modes actually drives the uh, regional uh, variability uh, on the right, I'm showing the uh, SVD analysis for uh, summer precipitation and SST from the Mishra et al. And they uh, found that the ENS mode and IPOC mode actually drive the regional uh, precipitation over the India. The first mode uh, represents the, uh, the positive uh, uh, dry conditions when we have the El Nino. And we see, uh, we see uh, uh, dipole pattern. And we can see the similar uh, features in the SVDS the analysis that I showed the, in the previous slide. The uh, dry conditions with the ENS condition and the dipole uh, patterns with the uh, IPOC mode. So the representing this model is important. Uh, sorry. And the, these signals are related to the predictable regions. Uh, again, we see uh, strong signals of the ENS mode and IPOC mode over the uh, predictable regions we uh, identified. Uh, so the representing these modes are important uh, for improving the season prediction model. And th this slide shows the uh, representation of the ENS mode in the C3S models. Uh, I can uh, uh, go in details, but the, uh, basically the almost all latest models capture overall ENS influence on the large scale precipitation. But, but if we looked at the regional, uh, uh, regional pattern, uh, some, not all, reasonably capture uh, regional precipitation over. Uh, the South Asia. And this is the uh, IPOC mode. Uh, this slide shows the IPOC mode. The, we can see that uh, the representing IPOC mode seems to be more difficult than the ENS mode, but the majority of the models uh, uh, roughly capture the observed pattern. And uh, we can uh, we can see that some models uh, present the IPOC mode IPOC like patterns. Uh, uh. So how this representation of the climatology or the teleconnection relates to the, uh, uh, the, the prediction skills. Here I'm showing the uh, uh, pre uh, pre presentation prediction skill with respect to the pattern creation of presentation climatology over the uh, Asian summer monsoon region. 
And we see a good relationship between the uh, prestation prediction skill and the uh, and, uh, pattern creation of uh, prestation climatology. See. But if we looked at the C3S models, more uh, plot a uh, bit scattered, and what do make the skill difference? So I checked the uh, representation of teleconnection. And on the left, we see the uh, prestation prediction skill with respect to the centered pattern creation of uh, NIN 3.4 SST uh, teleconnection. Here I'm I computed the uh, pattern, uh, uncentered uh, pattern creations uh, uh, of the uh, uh, regressed uh, presentation pattern on the NINU 3.4 SST. And we see uh, uh, positive uh, creations. So uh, this means the improving the uh, representation of the ENSO rainfall teleconnection uh, is a key uh, for improving the seasonal prediction of the rainfall. And on the right, uh, I'm showing this similar plot for the IOB or IPOC mode uh, teleconnection. And uh, if we looked at the C3S models, we see a positive correlation, but we don't see a clear uh, relationship for the CHFP. Main because uh, the some models uh, actually have the uh, not good uh, uh, representation of the ensemble teleconnection. So, but for the uh, C3S model, we see a, a good uh, relationship. So let's move on to the sub channel. Oh, okay. and you wrap up. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, this slide is just showing the uh, the uh, example of the subseason predictions. Now, uh, S2S focus are now reality. And however, if we looked at the Heineken skill, is skill the skill is still raw, which emphasizes the needs of the future improvement. And but there is hope. We know that the boreal summer interseasonal oscillation is a uh, 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 key for the subseason prediction. The previous study evaluated the skill and uh, and the the uh, the ECM WF model uh, uh, presents uh, uh, steady progress in predicting the 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 prestation skill over the India and we see uh, a steady progress uh, improvement in terms of the uh, the BSI so so future changes, we need to improve, <laughs> improve the skill. To do that, we, we need more uh, process-based understanding of the model errors. Uh, we hope to, we anticipate the user-oriented uh, focused information, including the monsoon onset for agriculture. So I'm conscious of time. <laughs> I just stop here and uh, leave the, the summary. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Takaya. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question or quick point to discuss about? If not, uh, I don't find it. There is no the hand raised the hands also. Thank you so much to speak about this uh, S2S uh, code project and very interesting ideas. Now we are really very much uh, constrained with the time and we have already run out of time. Uh, so I don't want to speak much on this issue of uh, what we are being presented. You have had all the uh, presentations and we had a couple of discussions. We could not have discussion on uh, one or two presentations. I now thank all the presenters and uh, also the speakers uh, who wanted to ask some questions. Uh, they can contact them, uh, the speakers, privately to get their clarifications on this interesting work done by all the four scientists. Thank you so much. Professor Dasar for kind nice chairing the session and we had very good four talks and uh, uh, thanks to you chair and as well as all the speakers for the very excellent talk actually, which is available. So 
there are not much uh, time for question and answer, but uh, anyway, we, we can write to the speaker directly. Uh, the video will be available. YouTube is available. So yeah, that can be there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the session. So yeah, uh, this hall again, we will continue the, uh, the parallel session. So that uh, just uh, in two or three minutes, we are going to start that one. Hall B already people have joined. <coughs> So here, uh, Hall A, we'll start in uh, just a two, three minutes. Let me see who are the people available, the speaker, the parallel session. The Dr. <coughs> Dev Niyogi, is it available? He has to coordinate the session, but if he not available, so he'll do that from our end. Okay, so not that. Then, uh, the about the party speakers yes uh, sipra jain is available uh, she has given the recorded video oh she has given the recorded video okay so that is that uh, video you will play from our side now fine yes sir and, and, uh, she, and uh, she will be available online also to uh, give any comments or to give a reply for the questions or not. Okay, she will be available online? Yeah, that's what she communicated. Okay, so recorded video available. Then what about next second to Ankur Gupta? Yes, sir, he is available. Fine. Yeah, I am available. Yeah, Shiromani Jayavardhane. I think we have to move this talk, I think. I think he sent a, he sent a video message and uh, he's probably happy to join after my talk because he has uh, some electrical power cut problem. So if that's okay. Okay, okay so say, sir, after yeah, your talk, you join. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Karuna Sagar? No. Karuna Sagar? No, sir. Yeah, okay. Then uh, last one that Periel uh, Philippe is there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, so yes, so let us uh, start the session. First, uh, the, the climate change and monsoon by C. Prajan. So, we have got a video, recorded video. So, uh, I will request our team to kindly play the session. Hello everyone, my name is Shubra Jain and I work as a project manager at the University of Edinburgh. I would soon be joining Center for Climate Research in Singapore and that is why I cannot do this presentation live uh, because I would be somewhere in transit. So today I'm going to talk about the extreme trends that are possible in Indian summer monsoon rainfall for multi-decadal time scale. In this world, we propose a methodology where we have used the seasonal hindcast for multiple seasonal prediction systems to provide changes in the Indian summer monsoon rainfall that extends up to like 30 years in future. Uh, so uh, since the time is limited, I'm not going to go too much deep into the methodology, but I wanted to give you a little bit idea of what we did. So I'm using the seasonal hindcast data, uh, the uh, rainfall hindcast for June, July, August mean, which were initialized with May start dates from the Climate System Historical Forecast Project. Before using the uh, models that are available through this project, we have carried out some fertility tests for mean climate. Uh, we have looked at the biases and bias corrected the rainfall uh, hindcast using the climate logical difference between ensemble mean rainfall as well as observations. Uh, we have looked at the various internal variability correlations and made sure that the models that we select are skillful. We have also looked at the probability distributions, mean standard deviation, skewness and kurtosis, as well as the ENSO teleconnections to uh, ensure that the teleconnections that are uh, simulated in these seasonal prediction systems are comparable with the observations. Uh, so the fertility test summary uh, on 
more details are provided in two of my papers, which are provided on this slide. Uh, so the idea here is to sample a large range of internal variability and study the plausible changes in the extreme rainfall and quantify those, the risk of those extreme trends. Uh, so we arrange the data in the format that I show in the figure. There are 69 ensemble members in 33 years. Uh, I want to emphasize that it's really important to preserve the order of year because we want to preserve the uh, climate sig signal in the in the rainfall handcast. So for each calendar year, I selected one ensemble member randomly by bootstrapping and created a resampled time series. And this was done for each length starting from 10 years to 30 years. And for each length, I created 10,000 time series. So now using these uh, 10,000 time series, uh, I have answered a series of questions, which I'm gonna show you in my next slide. But before we do that, I wanted to give you a spoiler of the key result of this methodology. So the graph that you see here shows the changes in rainfall for the next decades using CMIP 6 and CMIP 5 projections. Uh, and one of the time series that you see here is uh, a pseudo time series or the pseudo production that I am giving using the six hindcast data. So what I wanted to do is pick one line, make a wild guess which one it could be. And towards the end of my presentation, I'm gonna tell you that which one out of these all uh, projections is from the season hindcast. So the first question that we are trying to answer that why there are trends, the wetting trends are missing in observations. Uh, as you may already be aware, for the late 20th century, starting about like 1950 to up to like 2010, the observation showed a really strong drying trend, uh, particularly over the north central India, whereas the generations of the CMIP models have been showing a consistent increase in the Indian summer monsoon rainfall. This has been really puzzling that why there is a mismatch between the what models have been projecting and what the observations show. And to explain this mismatch, various hypotheses have been proposed, for example, changes in aerosol loading and forcing warming of the Indian Ocean or changes in land use and land cover. Here, we emphasize that these drawing trends can also occur by chance, and that is the null hypothesis that I'm testing here. The figure that you see shows the probability distribution of the rainfall from the CHFB uh, and the, um, the observations. And as you can see, the observations lie well within the envelope of the internal variability that is sampled by the multi models here. In fact, we found that the internal variability can be large enough to negate or even overwhelm the wetting trends due to the greenhouse gas form forcing into the climate and give a temporary drawing trends. Uh, there is another interesting result that we see in this figure. Uh, if we go from the 10 year to 30 years, the PDFs are sh consistently shifted towards right. That means that wetting trends are being more favored over drying with the increasing length of the period. Uh, I think that it has a lot of implications for, uh, from a policymaking perspective. So for example, if we are looking at the 10 years in future, then flood and drought could be equal risk because there is an equal chance of wetting as well as drying. But if you're looking out to like 30 years or even longer, then floods are definitely a higher risk. So our resources as well as policies, I think should be inclined towards tackling the floods. So the second question that we're trying to answer, what are the chances of wetting trends uh, as compared to the drying trends? So for 10 year period, there is 60% chances of getting a wetting trends, whereas the chance of getting a drying trend is 40%. But as we go uh, towards the longer period to 20 or 30 years, the wetting trend chance increases to 70 and 80% respectively. Uh, we have also compared the worst possible event uh, from the observations and the multimodal ensemble. And as you can see, for all the periods like 10 year, 20 or 30 year, the uh, observations are under predicts uh, the chance of uh, the chance of uh, worst possible as well as the magnitude of worst possible event. Uh, so our key conclusions from this uh, graph is that uh, the observations uh, underestimates the intensity of worst case scenarios, and these uh, 
intensities or these uh, probabilities are more uncertain as we go towards the longer period. And it's purely because the observational data is available for only 100 year period or so or the Indian summer months or the Indian months in region. Uh, so here is the graph again that I showed you in the beginning. Here we compared the predicted change in seasonal hang cast with the CMIP-6 as well as CMIP-5 projections. Uh, the solid line uh, that you see in this graph shows the mean change and the CMIP uh, uh, projections shows that for high as well as medium to high emission scenarios, Indian summer monsoon can rainfall can change by about like two to six percent by the year 2050. And we get uh, we got a similar estimate uh, from the CHFP, uh, which shows about like five percent. So we think that it's it's uh, it's uh, within the range which is projected by the CMIP. Uh, we are also looked at uh, when can we expect the climate change signal to emerge outside the envelope of internal variability. So the dotted uh, red region that you see here shows the envelope of internal variability, which I have created using the 10,000 time series of each year. So there are, the shaded region shows uh, the one sigma deviation. And as you can see in this figure, all the solid lines for all emission scenarios lie well within the well within the uh, this shaded region and therefore we do not expect the climate change signal to emerge outside the envelope of internal variability at least until 2050. Uh, we have looked at the impact of trends in sea surface temperature, the figure that you're seeing on right. Uh, here I've compared the trends in rainfall with the trends in sea surface temperature for the length 20 years. The correlation is relatively low. It, for about like 0.2 to 0.3, but I want you to focus on the slope. So over the 20 years from the last figure, we estimated that climate change can lead to a mean change of 30 mm rainfall, and that's the increase in rainfall that we expect to see in the next 20 years. Uh, but uh, from this globe, we can decipher that uh, if there is a 1.5 degree cooling or heating of the Nino 3.4 region, it can actually double or negate the projected change in rainfall. And even a lot, an even larger change of up to a TMM over the 20 years is also possible. And we also found a similar sized uh, but relatively lower impact from the East Indian Ocean, but relatively higher impact from the West Indian Ocean. Uh, so here I'm looking at the role of background circulations in driving extreme changes. Uh, so we looked at the time series which were which gave us the most extreme trends out of the 10,000 time series. And we found that there were several instances of the extreme wet and dry JJA uh, summer monsoon precipitation during the most extreme trends. So from our Monte model ensemble, we took 10 wettest as well as 10 driest uh, uh, ensemble members and years. And we looked at the upper level, that's the 200 hectopascal wind anomalies. As you can see, there is a really nice circumglobal Rossby wave that's traveling or across the globe. And it appears that it's emanating from the North Atlantic region for this case. The tinted region here shows uh, the region for which the Rossby wave propagation is not permitted according to the Zunomi wave theory. But as you can see, the Rossby waves uh, is very well contained in the wave guide that we that we have uh, plotted here. So we expect that the future changes in the rainfall, at least uh, and specifically for the longer periods, would be strongly affected by the intensity as well as the propagation of these waves. So here are some key takeaways from my talk. Uh, we found that the wetting trends are systematically more favored over drying, but the drying trends can occur in the observational record just due to the internal variability. And we found that the past changes in the rainfall, particularly the drying changes, uh, can also be explained by uh, the internal variability as it's large enough to revert the wetting trend in rainfall due to the greenhouse gas forcings. 
the largest 10 year trends that we see in current uh, observational records show about like 20% reduction in JJA total rainfall. Uh, but from the multimodal ensemble, we find that this reduction could even exceed 30%. So the chance of occurring that would be relatively lower. Uh, we also calculated the 1% uh, probability values, and we found that for any uh, 10 year period in the future, there's a 1% chance that the monsoon rainfall can increase or reduce by one fifth, almost like 20% over the next decade. Uh, we found that the observations give a poor estimate of the most extreme trends, particularly for the periods which are longer than 10 years, whereas the multimodal ensemble obviously gives a more statistically robust estimate. Uh, the climate change signal is not likely to emerge outside the envelope of internal variability by the year 2050, and the trends in the rainfall are strongly impacted by the trends in the sea surface temperatures over the Western and Indian Ocean. And 1.5 degree warming or cooling of this, uh, uh, these regions can double or negate uh, the influence of climate change on rainfall trends. Uh, so in addition, uh, the circumglobal Rossby wave trends is a potential avenue of future research for the decadal prediction of Indian summer monsoon rainfall. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, and with this, I, I think that I can end my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, or if you just want to catch up for a casual discussion, uh, please feel free to email me at this email ID. Uh, this is my Gmail ID as my official email ID is not active yet, but uh, I, I check this inbox quite frequently. So thank you so much for listening to me, and I hope to hear back from some of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sipai, for a nice video. Actually, yes, it's very interesting talk. Definitely, people will contact you for further information or for further query. Thank you very much. Now, we'll move to the next talk by Ankur Gupta on substantial to seasonal prediction system at NCM Lab, rainfall productivity and associated teleconnection. Yeah, just a minute. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. So, are you able to see the my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, my talk uh, is on the subseasonal to sub seasonal prediction system at NCMRWF. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, I'll introduce. Uh, I'm not able to move my slide. Uh, Okay, now, so uh, here I am briefly describing the system we have at uh, NCMRWF. We have uh, both the systems uh, at uh, S2S uh, uh, time scales are based on a couple model uh, in which the atmosphere is at 50 kilometer. We are using a, a version of unified model. It's coupled to the 25 kilometer uh, ocean model, NEMO in this case, so having a 75 levels in the vertical. Uh, so for both, for, for uh, to support the forecast, uh, we uh, carried out a set of high casts, uh, which is 23 years long from 1993 to 2015. And uh, 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 we, uh, uh, and the extended range prediction system is uh, based on uh, uh, a, a multi-week uh, forecast, so up to four weeks of forecast. So every week from uh, Sunday to Wednesday, uh, using those initial conditions, we issue four, uh, we, we carry out four runs up to 36 days of uh, simulation. Uh, so that makes like uh, four members per day and uh, four days in a week to 16 members. And uh, uh, to, to be compatible with the IMD's definition of the week, we, stay, we, we issue a forecast on uh, Thursday for the week beginning on Friday to next uh, Thursday, next Wednesday. So uh, here I am showing some of the sample uh, 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 forecasts uh, which were issued in the last uh, one year in 2021. So uh, in the right we can see uh, uh, an active uh, a forecast verification for active phase and a break phase. 
Uh, in this case, uh, the active phase was in uh, 9th to 15th of July, which is uh, uh, shown in the observed plot for, for over the extreme uh, left, and then corresponding to the four weeks of uh, lead, time, lead time for forecast, uh, uh, valid, valid for the same time period. So we can see in the fourth week forecast also that the model is able to capture the spatial structure very well and the intensity of the rainfall. Uh, similarly, for a break phase from 25th of June to 1st of July, we can see that the uh, model is able to capture uh, the spatial pattern of the rainfall, the, of reduced rainfall in the northern uh, region, uh, into Gangetic Plains and eastern in India in day in week four, four also. Coming to the seasonal forecast, uh, this is uh, uh, as, uh, the kind of forecast we uh, make, kind of plots and the forecast products we make uh, for the seasonal forecast. So for 2021, uh, the bottom in the bottom panel, the first row is showing the uh, uh, full fields of uh, forecast, then then the anomalies, and then the probabilistic forecast. So we can. Uh, uh, for 2021, the forecast was uh, mostly in the normal category for most of the grid points, uh, except uh, in some of the areas it was above normal. We have also started looking into the snow forecast, which is uh, uh, important during the, the season of uh, December to February. And uh, uh, we see that the model, model uh, do have a lot of internal uh, interannual variability, but we are, uh, we are in the process of uh, comparing it with the observations. Uh, here, so we are not issuing the snow forecast yet, but we are just looking into the uh, these kind of products as well. Um, so here I'm showing the uh, skill of the system at across the time scales. So towards the left, we have uh, this is the weekly uh, scale over the met subdivision. So in the four uh, four plots are for uh, different lead times: week one to week four. And in the week one, we can see the most of the scale is above uh, 0 0.5. In week two, uh, uh, most of the most of the subdivisions, mid subdivisions have uh, scale above 0.4. So, but in week three and week four, uh, we barely uh, see uh, any useful scale. So, coming uh, so remembering the previous plot in which I have shown the some of the forecast uh, is good in the, in week four, but when we are looking at the scale uh, over a longer time period. Uh, we can say that the, we can rely on this system up to for the week to forecast only. Uh, so in the center uh, panel, uh, I have shown the uh, monthly uh, skill at different lead times. So this is the lead times here is like zero, zero days, uh, five days, 10 days, and uh, 15 days, which I'm uh, denoting here by uh, painted lead. So suppose you, uh, for the next month, uh, one wants to issue a forecast on 25th of uh, uh, 25th of the month for the next month. So this kind of analysis can tell us that what kind of uh, uh, scale the model has at those time scales. So we can see for the central India, the scale is about 0.6 or 0 0.7 uh, uh, for uh, for up to at least uh, uh, 10 days actually of lead times. And then comparing uh, across the different homogeneous regions, uh, we can see that the Northeast has the lowest uh, uh, skill. And uh, I have done some analysis which shows that this is uh, because of the more spread in the model and uh, uh, the noise in the model is uh, more in the Northeast compared to the other regions. Similar uh, uh, information is shown on the right uh, panel except over the spatial plot uh, over different homogeneous uh, definition of different homogeneous regions. In this case, it's homogeneous regions. Again, uh, these are the uh, the first printed lead times for the monthly rainfall. We can see the very useful uh, skill for the monthly rainfall uh, over most of the regions of the India. Uh, this is uh, a continuation of the scale analysis at uh, seasonal time scales, and uh, I'm comparing here two different uh, systems. Uh, uh, one is very close. Uh, one is UK Met Office, uh, which is uh, our own system is very close to the UK Met Office, and comparing it with the UK with the ECMWF uh, uh, seasonal forecast. So uh, uh, this is the interannual variability uh, of JJS mean rainfall. We can see that uh, the bo both the models are able to capture the interannual well. On the seasonal time scales, the scale is uh, less 0.5, but uh, for let's say the uh, model initialized in May, uh, but we can see uh, that uh, if we talk about the sign of the rainfall, those are captured uh, quite well by actually both the systems. So in this case, 11 out of 19 uh, years uh, uh, seasons, the model is able to capture the sign well. 
so this is uh, our the, our system is just slightly better than ECMWF, which is able to capture the 10 out of uh, 19 times. But more importantly, I would like to highlight the years of uh, failed forecasts, in which uh, which are common in both the models. So the uh, the droughts of 2002, 2009, and 2016 are not captured by either of the models similarly the above rain, above normal rainfall of 2006 and 2013 uh, are again not captured by the model so this these suggest very uh, the kind of signal is quite similar in both the models for the seasonal uh, prediction we uh, would like to look into how the drivers of the monsoons are captured well and how what are their teleconnections with with the monsoon of seasonal mean rainfall so here I am showing the internal variability of uh, Indian summer monsoon rainfall ISMR Nino 3.4 uh, uh, index, Equino, which is the equatorial wind index uh, in the Indian equatorial Indian Ocean, and the DMI, which is uh, uh, the SST uh, difference in the anomalies of the SST in the east and the western parts of the equatorial Indian Ocean. So here we can see the internal variability is captured again well by uh, the model. This is uh, the model initialized in uh, June. Uh, for the JJS mean uh, and uh, uh, Nino for the skill of the Nino is quite high, uh, more than 0.9, uh, but for ISMR it is uh, 0.6. This is for initialized model initialized in June, so the skill is slightly higher than uh, what I have reported, uh, what I was say, saying lastly for the May initialized models. But uh, for Equino it is uh, almost 0.4, and for uh, IOD it is uh, 0.5, so much less than the Nino, which is the main driver uh, of the Indian summer monsoon. So uh, looking at the observed teleconnections, uh, uh, the top panel is the observed teleconnection, the bottom one is the simulated teleconnection, so again the JJS mean. So uh, here we can see the in the left, uh, the ISMR correlation with the Nino, in the center relation with the Equino, and in the uh, right part, uh, the relationship with the combined index of Nino and Equino. So by uh, incorporating the information of Equino, uh, the uh, the variance explained by the uh, uh, this combined index to of the variability of ISMR has increased slightly. So this is a good sign uh, of uh, uh, having more information from from the observations uh, into the predictability of the ISMR. But when we look at the simulated uh, teleconnections, uh, the Nino teleconnection is simulated uh, okay, but over, although it is quite overestimated. Uh, however, the Equino uh, is uh, teleconnection with ISMR is not at all represented by the model. So these are some of the areas where for the future model development and uh, from where we can uh, expect to get more skill by improving these uh, uh, processes in the model. Uh, these are, I'll just uh, skip uh, uh, these ones. I just want to stress out this. Uh, uh, we got some uh, data from IMD or for the weekly forecast in 2018 and we just compared the performance of both the models so uh, although from 2018 just one year it is uh, it's not uh, uh, possible to uh, compare the skills so these are just the sample plots uh, both the models are able to capture some of uh, some of the signal by week three also in this case i'm showing the uh, observations uh, from 12th of uh, july to 1st of august in 2018 so this is a case of uh, northward propagation of uh, rainfall and uh, you can see the third row, which is the uh, MCMRWF model, it is able to capture that northward propagation in the week three also. Uh, and this is not a selected uh, plot. Uh, I mean, any plot we would see, we will see the second week will look very good, and the third week sometimes it get the signal, sometimes not. In this case, the IMD CSS uh, was able to capture the progression up to week two, but not in week three. But uh, if you look at some of the other biases, so MCMWF has, uh, as you can see, the uh, rainfall along the Arakan coast. Uh, that is not captured by the MCMRWF model, but while it is very much there in IMD CSS, even in week three. So uh, this is to say that if uh, uh, this is the case for combining both those models for getting the extended rain forecast, and IMD has already started doing the uh, seasonal forecast at the multi-model level, so it may be useful to do it at for the for the multi for the uh, multi week forecast. I just want to leave uh, this with. This I think slide. you can yeah, just uh, yes summarize. Yes, uh, just one more minute. Uh, so uh, this uh, this slide is actually uh, uh, representing some of the challenges we have uh, in forecasting of uh, 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 rainfall in uh, during the JJS at across the time scales, even the daily rainfall, but. 
beginning with the seasonal rainfall, I think this is the plot which uh, everyone is uh, familiar of working on the Indian monsoon that we have a dry bias. So on the top right, top left, we can see the UKMO uh, bias, uh, dry bias. Similar kind of bias and is present in the ECMF, although it is slightly lower than uh, what we have we have in our system. Uh, towards the right, uh, we can see the similar kind of uh, information to the monthly time scale. So we can again see some drying of uh, uh, land, uh, rainfall over the Indian landmass for uh, for different months. It's more in June, July, less in September, but it is there. Most importantly to note over here is the, I have shown the weekly biases for uh, the biases for the week one. So how these are developing uh, early in the model integration. So here we can see that the uh, the, uh, the dry bias over the India is it's starting with week one and by week four it's already very much there and looking very similar to the seasonal biases. So uh, these are some of the areas that if we improve the daily uh, our uh, our medium range it may have uh, 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 possibility of improving our seasonal forecast also combining with this uh, improving some of the teleconnection. So. Uh, these are some of the conclusions. I'll not read them out, but uh, some of these uh, 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 findings are presented in the, the papers listed here. Thank you, and I welcome uh, any questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, yeah, Ankur, yeah, very nicely you have discussed about the subseasonal and seasonal model, and also is uh, advanced means uh, is good to uh, means how it is able to capture even week three also. Yeah, at the any time we can combine it. And uh, since uh, lack of time, uh, you are not uh, having any question also. So we'll discuss further on this matter. Okay. Thank you, Ankur. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So we'll go down to the next speaker. It is uh, Jayavardhani or uh, Sesha I, I can go ahead because I have school run as well. That would be great. Okay, Thank you. Please, please go ahead. Uh, can I share my slides or do you, you will share? That depends on you. If you can do, fine. Oh, I, can, I, I can do, I think. Uh, share. Uh, it's, it's not allowing me to share. Can you share maybe someone? Uh, sir, did you uh, upload the your presentation? Yes, I uploaded it. What is what? It's in the PDF format. One minute. Okay, maybe I can. Uh, it's it's coming now. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yes, yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, sorry for this technical issue. Um, uh, first of all, it's, it's it's a great pleasure to talk in W um, um, seven meeting conference. So this work is carried out under the WCCP India. Um, so my name is Sheshagir Rao Kolisu, Aka Sheshu Kolisu. So I work uh, at Met Office, and I also thank uh, here my colleagues from NCMRWF. Um, and some of WF from Ashish and uh, um, and Ashrit. Um, so this is a, like a, a good collaboration between the UK Met Office and NSMO WF uh, piece of work. So my talk is a novel comparison of ensemble precipitation forecast accuracy and skill for the 2019 uh, Indian monsoon season. Uh, this is my content of uh, the presentation. So what is the motivation of this study? Uh, basically, we would like to understand the use of uh, um, like short range and uh, medium range models uh, to inform um, uh, like uh, for early preparedness and uh, um, a, a, an early warning for extreme or impactful uh, weather events, for example. So we have uh, uh, in this study that that's the goal of the study. And uh, I have used two um, different forecast modeling system, one from Glossy 5 UK Met Office uh, Global Ensemble Prediction and another one from Ensemble WF uh, NEPS-Z. And they have two different uh, time scales and special scales. Like uh, we have, like Met Office model has a 60 kilometer and then NEPS-Z has a 12 kilometer. And, and also it has a different uh, um, vertical levels and also um, type of attribution is, uh, I mean, uh, type of ensemble generation also different. 
Keeping in that mind, uh, we would like to assess the skill of uh, uh, these two models uh, for the 2019 uh, monsoon season. So for this, we have used the GPM, GPM uh, image rainfall data. Um, so I'm talking only about the rainfall. Um, and the, all the data sets are uh, regraded to Glossy 5, uh, which is a coarse resolution from the high resolution data tool. Um, and uh, in this uh, study, I'm, I'm talking about the different performance metric like RMSC and mean biases and the actual and potential skills. Um, so in order to uh, estimate the skill of the volume of the precipitation, uh, what we did basically, uh, there is, uh, we adapted the Wheeler et al. methodology where he accumulated with the different lead windows and different lead accumulations. So for example, we take one day window, uh, one day lead window, uh, lead, uh, lead time and with uh, um, uh, next one day accumulation. So one day, one day we call and the second day lead time and you accumulate another two, day, uh, two days forecast and so on. So you can go ahead up to from basically different time scales, weather time scales to so seasonal as well. Uh, but because of uh, the the length of the forecast, so we can only go up to 4D, 4D, which is almost a, a week to forecast uh, to compare the both the models. Um, and this is the I mean from the global model to um, we 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 choose the domain of uh, Indian domain. Uh, this is our study region, and you most of the people know uh, India has a different homogeneous rainfall regions. Uh, so we also uh, separate them. We also look, look into the different metrics uh, um, at this uh, sub uh, sub division uh, scale as well. So one of the study here, I'm showing the CRPS uh, continuous uh, rank predict, uh, predict probability score. Um, and you can see the CRPS score is increasing with the lead windows. Um, and this can be, CRPS can be decomposed, uh, decomposed into two parts from based on the hash batch. Uh, one is the reliability part, one is the under, uh, resolution and uncertainty. So the reliability is, is basically this, these are the two models. You can see the, uh, one would expect if the both the models are have a good reliability, they should be zero so as you see would you want i mean one day one day and uh, two, uh, two days um uh, lead time the reliability i mean uh, when when the lead time is increasing the reliability is reducing and also the um uh, crps uh, as, as spot uh, i mean uncertainty is, is also uh, spreading more um yeah, um, this is the one of the like um, how the model uh, mean error is uh, uh, I mean increasing with the uh, with the different um, lagged ensembles. So this is from the Glossify model, UK Metaphys model. We have a um, forty members um, can generated by lagged. Uh, because we have a, a forecast system for uh, um, uh, two two ensembles each day uh, at two different time scales. So we, by using that four members uh, per each day, so we we generated the forty members. So overall, what you see the error of the uh, uh, um, precipitation is increasing with the lead windows and with the lead um, uh, and some lagged ensembles, for example. And you can see like uh, dry biases over the uh, over the continent and wet biases in the ocean region. Whereas when you go to the NEPSI, uh from the NCMA WF model, the, the errors are different, but uh, uh, more or like uh, the similar patterns of error is uh, noticed that we have seen uh, in the RMSC as well. So this is the RMSC over the uh, core monsoon zone region uh, from the Glossify model. Um, uh, uh, this panel, upper panel, and this panel is the lower uh, two panels of the NEPSI model. So NEPSI, you can see uh, the errors are um, diff with uh, uh, higher lead windows. It's I mean it's staggered, uh, it's flat. But whereas in the uh, uh, glossy five, it is increasing trend. That's because of the lagged ensembles. Um, one point to note that at uh, uh, high, uh, lower lead time, uh, glossy five has a lower RMSC than than NEPSI, for example. So these are the errors. I mean, we are trying to um, address the bias, correct these uh, um, the errors uh, from some other study uh, from my colleague Marian. Uh, she was un uh, unfortunately she was unable to present here. Um, so one the other performance metrics here I have shown you, um, which is the actual skill of the the model um, from the Glossify and NEPZ. So these are the special patterns of NEPZ actual skill. Actual skill is basically the correlation between the time series of model and observation. Uh, the first column is the NEPZ uh, special pattern. You can see uh, the actual skill is increasing with the lead windows. Um, the second column is the difference between the Glossy 5 and the uh, um, uh, uh, NEPZ uh, skill. 
um, but um, uh, you can see the uh, the uh, pink uh, dotted lines are the we have done the SPCT kind of uh, um, test uh, where it gives the uh, uh, significant test of ninety percent. Um, so so overall, NFZ has a, a good um, actual skill um, compared to the the, the glossy five um, over the season. And this these are the um, again the latitudinal um, I mean longitudinal latitudinal variation of the uh, the skill difference. So uh, and and the uh, uh, and the arrows shows the uh, um, the statistical significant uh, 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 test significance. Which if if they they are statistically significant in the uh, in the skill that should uh, the arrow should not uh, uh, fall into the uh, zero line but most of the um, the arrows are following the uh, error bars are following in the i mean uh, touching the zero line but some of the you can see the pink one uh, they are not touching so there is there is a, some locations that nfz has a i would say uh, take a strongly uh, significant uh, in improve in the forecast compared to the um, glossy five but however, overall, I think I don't think so. They are uh, statistically significant. Uh, this is again uh, showing the. We also looked into the uh, sensitivity of the ensembles. So um, uh, from the two models, uh, and again, this is the different uh, in x-axis. You can see the different uh, uh, homogeneous regions, and y-axis is the difference between the actual skill in the first column. This is a potential skill. Uh, that's another metric. Uh, I'm not going to definitions of these uh, potential skill and all because of lack of time. So what we see here, um, the full ensemble for, uh, uh, skill, uh, first column, uh, and the second one is uh, if you if you reduce the only 23 members, um, what is the skill in the Glossify? Because Glossify has a 40 members and uh, NAPSC has a 23 members. So we try to reduce the um, uh, world members from the Glossify and see if there any skill improvement. So over the Central uh, India, um, this is for ton, uh, a full ensemble, 23 ensemble, 8 ensemble, and 4, ten, four ensemble between the both models and the, the skill difference. Um, they are quite uh, uh, central region at 1D, at least the um, first lead time, uh, they have a, a significant uh, significance in the skill. Um, uh, the differences are um, better. For example, NEPZ is better uh, um, compared to uh, 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 Glossy 5. Uh, that's only happening over the central India, not uh, um, in the other regions, for example. Um, the same as the potential skill, some locations and uh, um, at different uh, windows, uh, lead windows, the, the the skill is performing. So uh, there is no clear uh, um, uh, signal from statistically. Uh, um, there is a, a strong improvement in the uh, NEPZ skill over this uh, um, uh, um, uh, extreme monsoon season. And uh, as I said, uh, Marian is uh, working on the uh, the my colleague working on the uh, how do we correct the uh, bias uh, these errors by using their own forecast rather than using either observations or uh, uh, hindcast data um, to get ready set and go uh, to provide the forecast and for the decision makers for example um, um, to give the early warning for uh, extreme weather um, events things. So yeah, this is my conclusions uh, from my study. Um, I would I would welcome to take any questions. Thank you. These are my collaborations. We thank to all the collaborations um, under the WCCP India. Uh, it, it is it's a great project to work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shesu Kursu. Yeah, for your nice talk, how you are doing the collaborative work with uh, NCR scientists, and also you have shown the bias correction. So this is a good thing that models are improving. And now, if there is any question, so let me see. Yeah, if you're not there, if anybody has any question directly, can ask. Okay, so I think there is no question. So let us thank you, and I will go for the next speaker. Uh, that uh, yeah, you have joined us, Joy Burton. Okay, very good. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Let me share my. Uh, Presentation from this side. I hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, yes. 
Okay. Uh, so I'm going to present a case a case study about subseasonal forecast for disaster risk reduction. Uh, May 2018 at extreme rainfall event in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm Shiromani Jayawadana de from Department of Meteorology Sri Lanka. My co-authors are uh, Thierry Lefort, uh, Meteor France, Sarat Premanal from Adrim, and Chatra Riyanagi from Disaster Management Center, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, from uh, 19 to 27th May 2018, uh, we received uh, heavy rainfall over uh, northwestern, western, and southwestern parts of the country. Uh, so, uh, leading uh, uh, leading to severe flooding in northwestern and uh, flooding and landslides in southwestern parts of the country. And especially on 20th and 22nd, more than 200 millimeter rainfall received over this part. And according to the Disaster Management Center, uh, 175,000 people have been affected across 19 countries and 26 people killed. Uh, worst uh, affected districts are uh, districts located in the western part of the uh, country. Uh, so these are the synoptic scale uh, analysis. So we can see like uh, trough to the east of Sri Lanka from 19th onward and then uh, this uh, uh, deep trough uh, over uh, is north-south direction deep trough over uh, Sri Lanka uh, after 4, 24th and then uh, this is at 850 millibar layer and uh, at uh, uh, 500 mid levels, 500 media layer, we can see uh, my cyclonic circulation over Sri Lanka, especially 19th, uh, uh, then 20th, and again from 25th, uh, uh, 26th. Uh, so, uh, uh, like uh, uh, nearly uh, 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 three weeks before that, this event, uh, I received an email from Thierry Lefort. Actually, he sent this email to the monsoon group. I, I have subscribed to this monsoon group. Uh, in that email, uh, it mentioned that uh, based on the ECMWF monthly forecasting system, a better defined when Joe is likely to enter to the Indian Ocean by day 20. So this was on April 27. And uh, uh, based on our, our previous research, we found that uh, when MGO entered into the uh, phase two and three, especially uh, during southwest monsoon, as well as uh, especially during month of May, uh, uh, extreme rainfall is likely to occur, uh, especially uh, over western part of as well as southwestern part. So this uh, study has conducted based on uh, data from 1981 to 2010 and uh, using RMM index. And so this is the uh, MGO composite uh, of weekly rainfall probabilities exceeding 90th percentile. So we can see a uh, higher possibility of uh, receiving extreme rainfall uh, over the western part and south uh, as well as southwestern part in uh, phase two and three. So this is the actual RMM index uh, from Bureau of Meteorology. So uh, like ECMWF monthly forecast system predicted, so it entered the phase two on 17th and then stagnated there at 27th and then entered to the uh, phase three, 28 and 29 and then entered to the uh, phase four. Uh, so um, then when we analyze this uh, uh, ECMWF S2S uh, ensemble prediction, we found that uh, four weeks before also uh, this indicate uh, wet signal or western part, uh, then three weeks before again wet signal or most parts of the Sri Lanka and again two weeks. So the consistency of this uh, prediction as well as uh, MJO entering into the phase two uh, and uh, as well as based on our previous experience like in year 2016 and 2017, uh, but especially during month of uh, in third week and second week of the May, we received extreme rainfall event, uh, extreme rainfall uh, events, and which uh, uh, leading to uh, more than 100 fatalities uh, in 2016 and 2017. And based on all this information, we convey this message to the disaster uh, management center. And based on this prediction, they have taken several preparedness measures to prepare uh, the people uh, 
vulnerable people for worst case scenario. Uh, so the two uh, approaches adopted the national level approach as well as uh, uh, local and community uh, level. And uh, so uh, the preparedness uh, uh, meeting was conducted and all the uh, plans were developed based on uh, association of all stakeholders. Uh, and then uh, the lowest administrative division is Gramaniladari division in Sri Lanka. There are th more than 13,000 Gramaniladari divisions. And next level is uh, divisional secretariat division. Uh, where we have 380 uh, divisional secretary divisions. So all the vulnerable Gramanildari divisions and uh, division secretaries divisions. So uh, this uh, has a dentist can this is uh, undertaken and uh, try to identify needs and gaps and planning for uh, deployment of available resources and preparing for uh, uh, contingency plan for uh, worst case uh, likely scenarios. Uh, then uh, we, uh, especially during monsoon uh, forum, we discussed this, and then after that, uh, uh, the monsoon preparedness meeting was conducted by disaster management center. Uh, so, uh, uh, so pre-planning discussions were conducted with military and police, and then uh, district level emergency plans and awareness programs conducted, and then contingency plans uh, process for all uh, potential divisional. Secretary divisions by uh, National Disaster Relief uh, Services Center. Then uh, media campaigns also uh, conducted, especially this gum at the uh, Gama is the village in uh, Singhala. So gum at the uh, media campaign conducted, uh, and then uh, 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 like uh, uh, emergency operation. Uh, uh, so we distribute this type of uh, disaster management center distribute this type of leaflets. Uh, that means uh, preparedness before the disaster and in which in this leaflet uh, it mentioned like what to do before a disaster and during the disaster and after disaster and then uh, uh, hotlines uh, to dial during disaster and uh, especially deployment of search and rescue teams. Uh, boards for emergency responses and conducted mock drills and uh, uh, simulation exercises at district levels and uh, this uh, divisional secretariat levels. So all these preparedness activities conducted and uh, this uh, pre uh, based on this S2S uh, prediction. So this uh, uh, preparedness uh, activities as well as uh, action early action before the disaster. Uh, 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 reduce the death toll significantly in May 2018. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bhandarji. Yes, you have nicely highlighted the case study and it is not only the warning part, this is preparedness and awareness. This is also a very important component of disaster management and you have nicely highlighted that part for the case study. Thank you very much. If thank if you. Any specific questions? Uh, Yeah, so I think there is no question in the chat box. So thank you, uh, ma'am. So thank how you. can I? Uh... Yeah, stop sharing. You can do the stop sharing. Okay. Go to, go to the top somewhere and. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, right. okay. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So I think one talk in that uh, that Karuna Sagar is not there. So we'll go to the last talk of the session. That is uh, I can't pronounce this one. Perilia Philippe. Okay. It is monitoring. Thank over... you. Yeah. So please go ahead. Monitoring and forecast of international variability over Africa. Yeah. Sorry to share my uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, please. Yeah. Okay, so let me share my screen. Yes, sir. Sure. Can you see the uh, the talk? Yes, yes. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to present you uh, uh, a 
and it and a research operational action uh, that Meteor France is uh, taking with West African meteorological country. Uh, so I work at Meteor France at the, the research centers, and, and you can see the different partners that we have. Um, the last few years we've been funded by WMO, so uh, which I'd like to, to thank about this. And so let me start. Uh, so the first uh, first thing to know is that over West Africa, uh, um, uh, weather forecast models are uh, not very uh, skillful. And uh, I uh, show you this example of uh, uh, Roger et al, uh, who shows that uh, basically if you perform a score on daily rainfall with uh, uh, multiple ensemble uh, rainfall, that's use a climatological reference, you uh, barely do the same. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, with the score being zero if you, it is the, the greater. So it means that there is a, a poor skill uh, in terms of rainfall over West Africa. So what we uh, uh, try to do for the last um, about 10 years, uh, we develop a strategy to um, uh, look for predictability in uh, other parameters than rainfall and uh, by post-processing different uh, diagnostics. So this is what I'm going to show this, uh, first, uh, the overall strategy. Uh, so to illustrate this, uh, I show you this time series of rainfall over West Africa. And uh, like many other monsoon region, you can see that there is a strong uh, temporal variability at specific scales. So over West Africa, compared to some uh, place like India, um, synoptic variability is very strong and is very key to understand. And it's taking place within uh, uh, quite larger and slower uh, variability uh, that we also want to understand. So basically focused on this three scales. So uh, in this uh, action, we, uh, we decided <coughs> uh, to look for a specific parameter, mostly, uh, which is precipitable water, which is the uh, vertical integral of um, water vapor. And basically, we try to use integrated uh, parameters to uh, take advantage of the better uh, uh, representation by uh, forecast models. So in terms of data, we will use ECMWF data, mostly deterministic and uh, sub-seasonal forecast. And we're going up to the scale of seasonal forecast in this uh, action. So let me show you just a global frame of what we did. Uh, something very important for us is to have a seamless uh, approach and that range from a large scale, seasonal scale, down to the sub-seasonal scale, and to finish at the, the weather scale. And uh, we basically developed the same diagnostic at these three scales to allow detect uh, the arrival of uh, sub-seasonal events uh, and, uh, and try to uh, take some uh, relevant information from this. Uh, last point, I, uh, we, we, we develop also a very uh, interactive discussion with the uh, West African groups uh, under the forms of a weekly briefing, uh, during which we discuss about the situation of the three coming weeks and also evaluate the, the, the past forecast we did. So this is a very uh, rich part of, the, of this project. So a few examples of forecast project that we developed. Uh, first, I gave you the, the website of the, this, uh, the MISVA, so this is here. And if you go there, so you have a, a player with different scales, uh, observation, sub-seasonal and seasonal. Uh, this is in French so far, but there is a, an English version uh, that is being developed. And you can see the, the kind of product you can have. You can have maps of uh, different parameters, time series over different regions. So it's mostly over Africa, but a lot of products are also global. And you can get information also for, uh, uh, for different countries and different regions. So here's an example of how we proceed. Uh, we work uh, first with raw data on the top right, anomalous data. Uh, on the middle and to derive uh, precipitation analysis on the on the bottom and what you see is that uh, considering precipitable water you can detect uh, areas where um, there is enough humidity to uh, trigger precipitation regarding the anomalous data you can see the propagation of um, of perturbations of african history wave or different kind of wave and uh, over west africa the specific uh, pattern here uh, the moist pattern uh, really matches well the uh, precipitation pattern. So this is what we use, uh, the kind of idea we use. We tracked the, the moist anomaly above a specific threshold to uh, to derive the precipitation pattern. And it works quite well in the end. Uh, it performs better than, than precipitation. Uh, another example that is very important for us is the um, 
uh, identification of equatorial waves using Wheeler and Kiladis filtering. Uh, so this is available online, basically through a CalCHREX website, uh, which use CEFS model. So we developed the same approach uh, by using ECNWF uh, model, which has very good property of uh, uh, representation of equatorial wave. So basically what you see here, for example, is the propagation of an equatorial Rossby wave uh, around West Africa, uh, which is also consistent uh, here uh, in the CEFS model uh, with a, a red contour uh, highlighting a, a moist anomaly. Uh, last thing we developed is a, a specific project based on precipitable water uh, in which we targeted the uh, uh, critical value that maximize uh, a high skill score uh, depending on different targets of precipitation. So basically, what I show you here is the difference of score between this product and uh, the, the precipitation forecast. And how to read that is when it's blue, uh, our product is better. When it's red, uh, the precipitation forecast directly by the model is better. And as you can see over West Africa, for week plus one, plus two, or plus three, plus three uh, the product we developed basically uh, always outperform uh, the forecast of precipitation. So this is this was done using the Einkast uh, for different periods. So basically, uh, under the last twenty years, it's uh, it seems to be very relevant. So to finish, I'll show you a, a case study on uh, that application, and I'll show you the case study of uh, a wet period uh, that took place during August uh, twenty nineteen. And you can see here over different country over Senegal at the bottom and uh, Burkina Faso on the top. Uh, it's precipitation time series, and you can see this wet anomaly here that followed a dry period. So it's a weekly precipitation on the right, and you see at the daily scale that there were also some uh, extreme precipitation event that took place during this period. And uh, this is observation with uh, anomalous rainfall uh, to the left and precipitable water to the right. And you can see the, the arrival of this uh, uh, really uh, wet uh, pattern uh, from eastern side and that passed through the western side during these two weeks, and it was associated with uh, the arrival of a, a really uh, large-scale wet bulb uh, coming from the east and that crosses uh, the West African country. Uh, this was associated with an equatorial Rossby wave, uh, and we, uh, we tried to investigate how uh, soon it was forecast. So basically, uh, when we were doing the, the forecast, we, we managed to anticipate this event like four weeks ahead which is quite impressive. And I show you here, uh, so the different forecast time uh, of this event. So at the bottom, you have precipitation anomaly, uh, precipitable water anomaly uh, on the last two right, from uh, S minus one initialization, S minus two, week minus two, week minus three, and week minus four. So on precipitation, you can see that this uh, uh, strong anomaly of precipitation was seen about two to three weeks before the event. While with precipitable water, you can have it almost four weeks ahead, which was consistent with, with, between ECMWF and the uh, CEFS model. So this is really the kind of information we, we wanted to, uh, uh, to share with you, is that there is predictability uh, with the precipitable water uh, parameter, but also with equatorial wave analysis. Uh, this approach also is uh, uh, targeted to a transfer to operational centers. So this is what we did with uh, uh, the National Service of Burkina Faso, and they managed to uh, take over this uh, uh, methodology and, and uh, issues the uh, uh, built-in that, that you can see on the screen for uh, every week with a specific uh, subseasonal forecast for, for week two to week three. I'm uh, now going to the, uh, the perspective and conclusion of this uh, talk. Uh, so MISVA is a dedicated website for uh, West African uh, forecast, but uh, also global in terms of equatorial wave uh, that goes from synoptic to subseasonal and seasonal scale. Uh, it's mostly based on the forecast of climate drivers at different scale. And from this analysis, we can get a, a rich forecast and research uh, discussion uh, that took place during the, the briefings. In terms of scientific perspective, uh, we have now uh, more than 10 countries working with us, 10 centers, uh, finally ranging from uh, all West Africa. Uh, so this is uh, a great potential uh, using these climate drivers uh, with uh, sometimes predictability above three to four weeks. Uh, the integrated seamless approach is very key uh, to us, like understanding the, the low frequency uh, driven by the ocean and the subseasonal scale. It's something very important to uh, to update the seasonal scale. 
And in the end, uh, multimodal practice also helps getting confidence into the scenario. So uh, having more models with this kind of diagnostic will be a, a great improvement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a really wonderful talk on West African monsoon, uh, the intersectional variability of that day, how it is different from other things. And you have nicely highlighted uh, your collaborative work with uh, other models. So if I think if there is questions, we can go for one or two. Otherwise, definitely it, we will have an interaction with you uh, for any further query on the West African monsoon. Thank you Thank very you. much. So Thank it you. is, I think we, we conclude this session. So I must thank all, each and every speaker of this session. So it was a really wonderful session, starting from various talks, different parts of Cipra Jain. Yeah, then uh, Ankur Gupta uh, talked about your uh, NC Wonderlab system. And uh, the Joy Bardhane, ma'am, she was uh, just covering how the, how the preparedness and early warning of Sri Lanka uh, he highlighted very nicely means uh, for the disaster management. Then Rao Koslu, he also talked about the how EP made up and several model uh, means bias correction and modeling efforts they have done. And finally, the last talk is by our colleagues from West African Monsoon. So it is a wonderful session. Thank you very much. I think I must thank everybody. So with this, we conclude this today's session in Hall A and see you again tomorrow morning for the day four session invited talk parallel talk and also the poster session thank you very much goodbye